we're just uh, getting kicked off with um, yum, yum, uh, a little bit of making, a little bit of Blue Peter making. Now, what am I making today? I'm making, whilst listening to the radio, I'm so sorry, I'm making adjustable nuts. I've done this before I'm using Plast Aid and listening to LBC on the radio. So, hopefully, it won't impinge any copyright because, uh, hopefully, and the point being, there isn't any music, but still, the words spoken are copyright material, are they not? Yeah. Anyway, I've mixed up my Plast Aid stuff with a mixture of the liquid plus the powder, um, and I've put the liquid in first and added the powder until it gets to the right amount. Now, what that means is, I just turn this down a bit. What it means is that I'm going to probably end up with twice as much as I need, but that's cool because I'll make two bases. Now, just here's an old one I've got, which is in ready to use but I'm going to do a new one as well so I'm just going to cut this out of it dangerously protective impossible to get into shield <coughs> and when I've got it out I'm going to not <coughs> comes with this little X key um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to wind these little little doofers up until it hits the I don't want to make a dent. It, it used to make a dent, and actually making a dent leaves too little material. Because I'm using this plastic, I don't need these little impressions. In fact, I don't need them at all, really, because they're staying in place <coughs> by virtue of sitting inside the little... Anyway, whatever. Um, so this one's been filed down a bit, so... <coughs> this this will be bespoke to the particular one. So this is... I had sort of ended up setting this one up for a left-hander so I might continue that so I'll make two one for right hand one for left-handed um, <clears throat> partly because I've got a left-handed guitar MG coming through so that might be a good idea to prep that so this stuff the plastic is a bit stinky and it's uh, it's doing its reaction I've kind of put more than well not more than now I put enough powder in to get this into a fairly you know thick glue to begin with and um, you could probably add more powder until it's almost uh, you know not got any more liquidity but I prefer to sort of leave it at that stage um, although I have got spare powder because I didn't use enough before that's telling isn't it anyway so the point being is I'm going to use this stuff to roll into two two sausages and I'm gonna press these into there as it sets <coughs> down to the right kind of con uh, consistency or texture and um, and then I will kind of make sure they <coughs> set in that correct shape. Sometimes I've used the cling film on top but I don't think I need to. This stuff doesn't bond, bond. once it's past a certain stage it doesn't bond to this. I probably could use and now I've suddenly got nervous. Actually, what I'll use is WD-40 to ensure that it doesn't stick. So I'll just spray a bit of WD-40 on the bottom of all of these, or both of these pieces. Um, so this this will kind of harden, start to harden after a few minutes, it's depending entirely on the proportion of the mix, as they say, I haven't done accurately. Um, if I can find my WD-40 supply, <coughs> which could be much easier to set than done. Ah, wait a minute. That'll come in handy in a minute. Listening to the um, James O'Brien's Mystery Hour on LBC, which is a, a, light, a bit of light-hearted silliness. It's one of those kind of notes and queries things where listeners call in with peculiar questions, curious questions that they want solving. Um, now this is this is a these are the ones I made before in uh, what's that stuff called Nilliput. and you can hear they're pretty hard, so they're actually viable. If I hadn't got any plastic, I would use uh, any plast aid. I'd use the, that stuff. <coughs> so they're kind of there as backup, um, and it, and the beauty of them is is that the uh, the design of these things so they fit together perfectly. So I could just now shape this up for the particular guitar in question and it becomes a custom nut. It takes a while and you have to have your, your sandpaper um, <coughs> sandpaper bed, sled bed, board ready, sanding board um, and it 
this plastic is a bit less so but the, um, the, the milliput will clog up your sandpaper pretty quickly so I tend to band saw it um, just to get rid of the bulk of it and then work it down to the correct dimensions at the end. As I say this one's been already been slightly um, reduced in the act of sanding it so this one's a little bit taller so they, they, are, they are going to be two different molds which, are, which I'll keep them together once they're done. Um, uh, so oh, what else have we got? Actually I'll get warm enough to take my fabulous hat off. Uh, I'm probably about now. <coughs> it's 11 degrees now in the shed. Mm. Okay, so I remember doing this before on a video and it's incredibly time consuming because it takes forever to set. But it is a nice, nice thing about this material is it's slow enough if you get the proportions just about right. It's snow enough, snow, slow enough to uh, to be manageable. So I suppose what I'm going to do now is while that's recording, I think I'll just do another. I'll put it off to one side. Yes, it's like Blue Peter. Here's one I'm currently making a bit earlier. Oh shit, he's just tipped it over. Brilliant. That's absolutely fantastic. You hear, heard it here live. Look at this. What an absolute mess. Right. So not only did I tip that over, I managed to tip over a container. I caught. Yeah, that was my, my mistake. I caught, hooked into a string that was hanging off out of the container, and that pulled a whole container full of bits onto the floor, which I will now re oh God, find them again. Now there were no tuna screws involved here, so that's good. Now one, two, three, four, six. Pick up. Uh, we've got the yes, no. Where's it gone? That's not good. Lost. Hold on. There's the nut. Uh, so I seem to have lost one of the bridge studs. I'm losing my mind. There's one. Okay, now I'm missing one of the bridge studs. That's certainly right for having strings dangling out. So I'm going to have to go on a, a bit of a search for that. I suspect it's gone under there. Right. Okay. Momentary panic off. Yeah, I hate that when you've got you've got a, a string in a dangling out of a bridge, and it's, it, the little bits of string stick out and catch your clothing, and then drag the whole container. So it's uh, it's, it's kind of waiting to accident waiting to happen, as you saw. Right. So we're sort of back to where we wanted to be. Minus one bridge post, which I'm going to have to go searching for separately. After all that lovely cleaning up malarkey. Now I was, I was going to do something. Um, I was going to move this off to one side. <clears throat> I can't be trusted. And I was going to bring down um, Matitz's guitar. And get a close-up of it. So this is the this is the job we're doing this for. So I'm going to do a fairly, hopefully now, a brisk up close or close up. Is the other way it might be worth doing. I haven't got the handheld thing, so that's fine. I'll just do it by video. Oh, would you come on? Thank you. Right. So I suppose I need a sound cue as usual. Uh, there's a sound cue. Okay, so uh, look a quick up close look at Matitz's Harley Benton single cut SC custom, and it's in the ocean blue flame, and uh, it, it's got a quadruple A flame, uh, flame maple top, which is quite something. Um, pretty uh, fingerboard of some wood that isn't rosewood, but they've got a name for it, and I've forgotten. And up here, you've got the familiar. Harley Benton shaped headstock, but you've got this interesting set of trapezes. Um, and then you've got uh, what they call graphite four nut, whatever that is. Um, 
a, a slightly too low action, I seem to remember, um, which we can take care of, but a slightly high action on the base side, a very low on the um, treble side, we'll have to see about that. Um, we've got a major problem with a clicking, I've already done this haven't I? <laughs> oh, I'm such an idiot. A clicking, um, a clicking bridge saddle, which we've got to take care of, um, and I've got a replacement bridge for that. And then we've got this nice simple three-way control here, two volumes, one tone, and the volumes are truly in independent, which is what I like about it. The Roswell pickups here, and this one's a, a DiMarzio super distortion that um, Matitz has changed, uh, replaced. I've got a, actually a blemish here, you can see it, there you go, that's a little bit of a, a shame, it's taken a, a ding somewhere. Um, and uh, it's got a, a comfort cutaway, or a cutaway, oh, I can't get any focus, cutaway on the, uh, the what you call it, the horn, and then it's got a belly carve up here as well. Um, let's just check my sticky stuff, yep, still way off, sticky stuff. Uh, yeah, so they call this the SC Custom Line, uh, it gets in focus with um, chunky big Grovers. Well, do they call them Grovers? Yeah, they do, and I presume they're real. I don't imagine Toman would be in the fakery business. Um, so yeah, a lovely looking thing. A bit of a, I don't know if this, you know, this is sticky stuff. I think um, that's where Matitz uh, stuck the strap to it, so I'll remove the strap in a minute. The only thing I didn't like about this, I mentioned around the previously, was um, this coffin-shaped thing. I just think it's a bit angular for a, you know, smooth feminine shaped guitar and I don't mean that in a sexist, sexist way I mean the, the graceful curves um, which without a doubt are you know a more feminine curve than a male one all right um, I get into trouble these days but you know what I'm saying I'm, I'm not being sexist um, anyway uh, yeah so so having a kind of coffin shaped thing doesn't seem to work for me but um, I've got quite interesting that well the uh, stop bar is at quite a height which means the the I think the uh, brake angle might want to be a little bit more than that I mean it's okay but it's actually quite low uh, all told on the high E so I probably want to lower that down a little bit just to be on the safe side anyway so we're going to replace this um, nut here which is too low uh, I'm going to replace it with one of these adjustable ones if I actually get round to stirring this stuff okay and that's it for the close-ups for now for the close-ups. Let's see if I can close this down without having any more major accidents. Right, we'll come back to the sticky stuff which is starting to thicken up now. So a few more minutes and we'll be ready to play nut base formation. Um, so I'm going to just take a moment to clean the outside of this pot a little bit so that I don't end up getting any on my hands unnecessarily. I will get some on my hands when I roll it out or shape it out, but um, I'll try and keep the... Oh, hello door. Let's try and keep the uh, mess down to a minimum. Right, so there it is. Keep some paper ready. We'll bring up a temporary work surface. Let's close the door so the heat doesn't all disappear. I suppose, turn it down a bit. Okay, go back to where we were. Um, this this has to get quite a way past this stage still, but it's, it's heading there. What I discovered is, the, I did the last one I did for, I think it was um, Malcolm's guitar actually, I had so little left of the liquid that I ended up with a very dry mix to begin with, and I was worried that it wouldn't work at all. Now actually, as it happened, it performed, it was hard to mould because it was so dry and sort of biscuity, um, but it, it actually did work. It, it set to an incredible level of hardness and um, provided a you know, perfectly good base. So um, it's not a problem from that perspective. I guess what I mean is, um, if you get if you get it very wrong in in terms of too much of the powder, the the hardness still is is pretty um, impressive. So I don't know 
really if they're if either part is called the hardener or not. They're just one part's called the the powder, and the other part's called the liquid, and that's about as technical as they get. Um, like I say, too little liquid, as long as you can actually, um, it's not just dust, you know, it doesn't blow away like sand, but even with the smallest, the minimum amount of liquid to make it workable at all, it seems to produce a very hard um, final outcome. So that's very good. This will harden up within a couple of hours. So what I would um, probably do is I'll probably, excuse me, I'll probably shape these and then cut for a bit, I'll get on with a couple of other things and then we'll come back to um, Atitz's setup. I don't want to do the setup without um, having that nut fitted. It sort of defeats the object. So I've got some, <coughs> got the new bridge here, which is uh, a trusty, one of the trusty um, roller bridges, tunematic style roller bridges that I use. I get mine from Banson Guitars on eBay. Um, I've, I've bought from Ben for a number of years now and I've never had an issue at all. It's very quick, good quality stuff and um, good prices too. So, you know, you tend to stay with a trusted supplier. Um, so I get uh, things like these roller bridges and Vance and various P Wilkinson and Vance and pickups. These come ready, pretty much ready intonated. That pattern is just about drop on and go. <coughs> um, and they're, they're, they're listed as BM003, whatever that really means, but um, that's a perfect change out for a Harley Benton um, like this one. So we've got a great alternative, and that will cure our clicking saddle instantly. I, I, you know, it's one of those things that if you didn't have the 15 pounds to replace the bridge, you might have to kind of come up with a solution for it, but you know, for 15 quid, it's better than, um, fighting with a flawed, a flawed bridge from the outset and um, you know an additional motivator for uh, replacing <coughs> replacing it with the roller bridge of course is that the roller bridge the rollers themselves are kinder on the strings and um, better on the, the tuning when you bend the strings and so on um, so it's it's a kind of win-win all round to switch it out for one of uh, one of these things so it's a bit of a no-brainer, really, actually. You know, it'd be nice if you could get them with brass uh, saddles in there, for example, just for looks, really, but these function absolutely perfectly well. So we're still in the sort of pouring stage. This, this we have to wait, really, until this comes up as a single blob, um, and we start to we get to a point then where we can start to handle it. If you handle it now, it gets stuck to everything you touch, including your hands, despite having, getting, you know, getting ready with some of this. Um, if you're nervous about it sticking to whatever you're doing, because this stuff is designed to bond with plastic, there's some chemical reaction that goes on. Uh, it, it'll bond with plastic, particularly if the <coughs> if the if you use it in the wet stage. The more liquid it is, apparently, the more it kind of gets into the original plastic or whatever you're using. If it is plastic and it makes uh, it attempts to form some sort of chemical bond with it. Um, if you use it in the sort of putty stage, then it won't do it so much, and particularly as we're doing putty stage plus um, a bit of WD-40 will be enough. But if you're not sure, get yourself a little um, sheet of, uh, you know, either cling film if you've got it, or if you haven't, just take one of these thin bags, I do the thinner the better really, um, and just give yourself a, cut yourself some squares, and, and then before you know it, badly cut. Before you know it, you'll have ruined the material you started with. Um, you know, you'll have a couple of squares of <coughs> material that's more than enough. Uh, so once I've got the, my little lump of stuff, I can put that in there and I can squash this on top of that and that will actually do a pretty good job of making sure it has no chance of sticking. I might do it with one and just see um, how how reliable the impression is. Of course the best impression will be if you just put the piece itself into the material. Um, but you know, if you have any worries about it sticking. I've done this, um, the nice thing is that this sort of plastic doesn't stick at all into milliput, so you've got to, you, you have no worries about being able to kind of fit these up and then pull them out once they're dried. <coughs> it doesn't 
doesn't prove it any problem at all. Um, with different resins, you can get some that just seem to stick and it makes life hard. <coughs> so I would recommend one or the other of these if you're doing this. So this is when I offer this as a service to customers. This is this is the, uh, the I charge 25 quid for this. This unit here cost me about 12 to 15 quid, depending on the availability and who's selling it. Um, <coughs> and then I add a tenner for this process. Uh, this plastic stuff is pretty expensive. It's about 20 quid for these two little, two diddly little containers, right? So oh, 25 quid or something. It's not cheap at all. Um, it's worthwhile if you're offering this as a service, because I'll probably get five um, bases out of a single one, so it's a, like a fiver, and then really um, what I'm charging another fiver for in all of that is the time to do this, which is not a lot of money if you think about the time spent um, prepping this material and then molding it, and, and then they've got to sand it down to make it fit your nut slot precisely, because each nut slot for every guitar is different, which is actually one of the reasons why Factories <coughs> never get it right because they they kind of assume that every guitar is identical in terms of the fitting of the nut, which is, you know it isn't when you come down to it. Now I'm just going to cut this thing off because I don't need this little strap dangling off here. Right, so we're we're still kind of getting getting down to the toffee stage, um, but we want it solider than that. We want it all to come out in one big lump. So you're seeing it in real time. Last time I did think I did this. I think it was the one I did for Malcolm's and I made an absolute mess of it. But hey, while that's doing, I'm just going to have a look at something else. Now, um, I did, I had a, a nice little victory the other day when I, I'm making a custom built guitar for um, uh, David and um, he wanted uh, a, a black fingerboard with no dot markers or anything except on the side. So it's really important to make um, a custom built or a custom ebony neck. But we needed to use, this was the template, <coughs> we, we needed to make it this shape. Um, and paddle necks are very difficult to get in anything but Chinese rosewood or whatever they use. So I had to, I bought this cheap Chinese neck of 18 quid neck because in my experience that's actually been pretty good for 18 quid you know one in 20 have been twisted or unusable and that's not a bad um, ratio for uh, in su such a little expense and I've got several numbers and um, dozens of guitars made from upcycled versions of this neck that have performed absolutely brilliantly and to this day some of them are my very favorite guitars so I bought one of these cheap Chinese necks inspected it when it came um, it's, it's pretty straight I was happy with it and then I hacked off the rosewood with a chisel straight off now I didn't bother steaming it because I didn't want to put any twists or anything into this <coughs> this underlying maple I wanted it just as it is and since I didn't need to keep the fingerboard I chiseled it all off and then I flattened down this thing I made sure the neck was straight and flattened then I stuck on my replacement ebony fingerboard and, and cut it down to size, sanded down. Then I had a problem of a great big tall, flat, thick slab of ebony. So I made a jig, like a bridge of size, a Venetian bridge, and I ran the, it was very pleasing to use because I got this radius down, nine and a half inch radius, which I made the jig for, and this is pretty much ready to go. There's a couple of little tiny bits um, that, that I want to tidy up, and of course, there's some little ridges here which I'm going to sand out with the radius block. But the hard work is done. We've got a basic 9.5 radius. I've got to chisel this bit off the end. But the other part of this is to shape the headstock. And uh, you know, I've, uh, sort of, I've had a few eyebrows already, and people seeing me making this, and they've gone, "Oh, is that what the headstock's going to look like?" Now, it, for for most guitar people it's not a massively attractive shaped guitar and it's not a massively attractive shaped headstock um, but it's particular to Dave's oh, David, sorry, David's project and as a result um, it's, it's going to keep this look and, and design because it's, he's had a number of other guitars made and he's used them in various projects and it's, it's, it's important that they retain this style. Now this is the the front end um, 
uh, the front shape of this thing. Um, oh, the, sorry, the headstock shape. Now, I, obviously, I don't need all of this space, so I'm going to need to cut this back, um, and I'm going to cut it back from about wherever I can get the start from. It's going to be about there. So I'm going to mark this up, and I'm going to give myself a ruler. Again, this is a little bit. I'm guessing at the moment because it's not really as long as it's just about a 90 degrees to that it's just a bit of a, a guess and then we're going to put that onto there and draw out the shape um, from the very end it's going to be about right but then there's a curve here which is quite difficult to get up to so that that shape is we could do it on cellophane and lay it on there I drew it on back to front the first time so I'm going to do it this way around and we're going to get one two three tuners four five six so it's a reverse of what I've got here but we should be able to keep um, keep the string uh, the string alignment the same now I'm not going to do that just now because we're getting close towards the toffee pull out stage of this stuff it's not quite ready and this would stick to my fingers if I yanked it out too soon um, but it's nearly there so what I'll do is just chop this on the band so I can get in there clean up the other day My bandsaw is a bit poor. Um, it's not a very good bandsaw. However, um, what it is good at, let's see, can we get a bit closer? Yeah, maybe. You know what? I could go about another four mil closer. Uh, it's, it's, uh, the bandsaw isn't very good. It's a cheap um, Aldi one, but for the money, it performs brilliantly as a quick cutting device like this. I know that's um, it's, it's obvious, it's uh, self-evident that it's a cutting device. I guess what I meant was, um, it's a it's a good ripping device, you know, for, for just quick and dirty cuts like that. Um, but I wouldn't try and um, I definitely wouldn't try and cut a straight line with it. Um, always have to tidy up the line. So this is very nearly at its state where I can certainly pull it out. Um, I can't get the other bit out. So let's put this off to one side again. We'll come back to that. And we'll concentrate on this. Now I can touch it and lo and behold, I could probably pull it out into this, like, way, like that, keeping it off my fingers. You might find it sticks up too in a way we don't want a bit too eagerly to that. We just want to get the last bit out because it's so expensive. I'd like to use as much of this as humanly possible. So um, now we've got this big lump of stuff and now we've got to try and get it off here. <laughs> you can see it's uh, putting up a fight. <laughs> so it's going to stick to this quite a while so I'm going to have to be take the risk of handling it at some point. There's no way around it. It's like that. Okay. Now I, I can start to handle it without it sticking to my fingers. We've lost a bit on there but I'm prepared to put up with that. So here we are ready with our what's it. Um, we want to be able to mold it without it sticking so you know if, if you find you start handling it and it's it's still gonna stick then you're just a little bit early in the game and this is trying to a little bit um, so we're nearly there but possibly not just quite um, and it's trying to stick to my hand like dough or something but eventually it will uh, it will free up and if you're not sure you can sort of free it from the sticky bits on your hands and you can drop it on some surface and then clean up your hands again so there is a bit of loss along the way as you can see um, you can't, can't get every single bit of it but what we do need be able to do is to slice it in half. So let's get an old blade from my blade amnesty department. I wish you don't mind ruining these old things. And let's just cut it if we can <laughs> down the middle and separate off two bits. Two bits. And I'm just gonna drop that there and 
roll that one out too. So we, we're kind of paying attention to this now because it's getting close to our limit. We'll get rid of that and that because they're just going to get in the way. We'll get rid of that bit of sticky as well. We'll get that clear, cleared up for another use in future. And then we'll just sort of chase around these blobs. This one's sticking more than I want. Um, so I just got to sort of hope that it picks up some dust and keeps on moving. Hey, I see, hear the birds of spring out there. Right, so we've got the two bits now. Um, as you can see, one of them is sticking a little bit. So really what you've got to do at this point is to try. Um, maybe some oil on your hands isn't such a bad idea. I haven't got it on mine here, but um, it's, it's just about okay. We're not sticking too much. Um, but you've got to get to, you want to get to uh, a bit of a flat, tubey, torpedo-y thing. And we're, time now is starting to get critical. There's my first torpedo tube. And, and then my second one is a little bit more volume, I think. And we'll get that one laid out too. I've got a feeling that actually we'll, we'll dispense with the, um, see I can't roll it very well because uh, it's not, it's, it's, it's now not sticky enough to roll it, it's going to push along. So we've got our two here and I'm going to go with the WD-40 this time and not. Now I'm going to get a couple more blades quickly, in fact I'm going to get four more old blades, um, which I'll show you. And now what I'm going to do is do a quick underside spray on the pieces, okay? I'm going to quickly rub them off so that they're not too wet. And now we're going to clean my hands one more time. I'm going to just try and get these a tiny bit longer so we can start with exactly or just about the right length. And again, it's going to start settling down now. There's one two a little bit longer please all right okay okay here we go now first one this is the brand new one let's put it in there uh, whoops what we do is we get it right in the middle if we can and we press it down and then we get our little blade thing like this and we're going to push it push it in different directions so that we get the whole thing starting to spread out a bit so we're getting the the nut fully surrounded. Now this one, I'm looking, is just a little bit, uh, a little bit short, short changed at the very end of this one. So I'm going to try and push it round and get it where I want it. Pushing down like that, and then we're going to get this one. And again, if we can get this just that little bit longer before it sets, there we go, a bit longer. And we get this one, and we push this one in. It's the length very critical. You just want to get that surrounding. You want it to just come around the ends just right. It'll work if you don't. Um, just looks a little tiny bit neater if you can get it around that far end. So there's my little my butter pat patting paddles, if you like, just to get this squeezed up. And I'm pushing around the side here just to, to get that little bit of extra. Support when it goes hard, it won't matter that you've pushed it round, you'll just be left to um, kind of sand it back. So it's a, it's a bit wasteful um, of material because you can see that we're going to end up with a lot more cut off than we really use. Um, and ideally, what we kind of would like is a little bit more height than uh, not. Well, we want a bit of height on it so that we've got enough material underneath the actual nut itself. So that's starting to get there with that one. And this one, I'm gonna use the paddles to squeeze this one back to a height if I can, and then push it back in at the uh, correct depth. And we'll tidy up the ends again with this one. Get the square ends if we can, just to make sure it goes, fits all the way around and we get a snug fit. Now the key thing about this is you can just press it in and as long as it's all covered in it'll work. Um, sometimes what's quite good to do is to get it seated in the way that this nut seats. So the actual edge of the nut, or the top of the nut, tilts backwards. So if you can have it seated, seated in this with the, the nut tilting back so that the front edge of it is straight up and you'll be kind of close to where it's going to be at the end. If you're off a little bit you can, you can always um, sand back 
to exactly where you need it to be. It's not the end of the world. Um, this one, I'm struggling a little bit because I've. This one feels like it's just a little bit un, unsupported around here because of the way I've started a fraction too short, I think. But if I just let that set now, that's probably going to be all right. Just, just push that in a little bit more. So what I've done in the past is sometimes I've left these sitting here and the blades can you know, hold it in place while it dries. Actually, I don't think it's going to need it in that one, in that case. Um, I've done that more actually with the milliput stuff, which some of the milliput takes 24 hours to dry. Okay, so that is just about where I want it. I'm just going to have a look. They're a little, not perfect, but not the worst I've done. Okay, so once we let those dry, sorry, set, um, then we'll we'll kind of tidy up. And it doesn't matter if it, it's like this one, it raises up over the sides. What we want is, so long as the nut is seated on some resin and the shape, once we can sand all this back, the shape will still be impressed. Um, now, if you feel like it, you, you can actually be quite confident with the WD-40, you could actually remove these now, this one's perhaps a little bit more, uh, a little bit more, it's tilted this one a bit, I'm not totally thrilled with that, but you can actually remove the, uh, remove the nut and it'll stay in shape. But in this one, because it's a little bit different, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just reshape that one and leave it put. But you can see that one will dry with the impression perfectly shown in there. Now it's got a, it's actually quite a thin base under there, um, and in, in some ways I'd like to, I'd like to have made it thicker, but it's still, um, when we, we're going to place, uh, sanded off, the bottom side of these are going to be sanded off, so that when they stand on top of that plastic, it, it's only going to be touching the plastic, it's, it's not, it's not going to cut through it. Um, uh, anyway, yeah, so you can see this one's, this one overall has gone a bit twisted sideways, and I haven't been able to stop that from happening. Um, that's probably that's probably fine in the sense it's got more material underneath. That one's gonna I think that one's gonna sit quite well when it comes down to it. But anyway, so that's that. And these then will take a, an hour, an hour, maybe less half an hour or so to um, set and we'll be ready to make turn them into custom nuts, well one of them for Matitz is uh, HB here, and the other one for left-handed MG down the line. Okay, so I think what I'll do is I will, <coughs> I'll shut the camera off, I'll go and do something else, come back and we're ready to carry on. Okay, oh it's suddenly become evening, oops. <laughs> here we have the Harley Benton. Okay, so we're going to set this up and we're going to put on a custom tusk nut. There's one I made earlier. Um, so we're going to do the setup, we're going to change the bridge. So the first thing I'm going to do, basically, is let's change out this bridge, let's change out the nut and get all of our basic bits and pieces on that we need. I don't know how good this view is, or the camera angle I should say, because um, I'm not used to where it's currently positioned, but I'd love to stay there. So out comes this mm, graphite four, whatever they call this. Uh, it may, it's plastic in, in a sense. It might have some graphite in it, but who knows? Anyway, I'm also going to take off. Oh, interesting. They're sunken in a bit. These uh, these um, what do we call it? Inlays. They're a little bit further in. I think it's not something I would mess with. I wouldn't, in other words, I wouldn't add any, try and add anything like glue into there you, you, to bring it out level because you, you'd struggle to get it um, flush anyway, no matter how carefully you did it. It wouldn't 
wouldn't want to do that. Uh, I am seem to be missing a suitable screwdriver for this. Where have I put it? I don't know. Something a bit tight, that one. There goes the screw. Come on. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to tap off the old nut and you really haven't got many options. That was just placed on there. <coughs> I wouldn't even suggest there was any, um, doubt there was any uh, glue on it. <coughs> so what I'm just going to do is, <coughs> excuse me, line up my custom made nut and this is currently too high. Um, with everything set down where I want it to be. There's also a little bit of a corner missing off there. Uh, nothing I can really do about that. That was a that was just um, the way it formed, just a little curved compared to this side, but it's not the end of the world, I don't think. It's the function that matters. <coughs> so I need a little bit more sanding down here, and a little bit more to come off. Yeah the height of the nut as well so we're just it's a fine tuning I don't know what you can see now but the idea is I'm going to fine tune this so I'm just going to make sure it's thin enough <coughs> to sit in there so a tiny bit of material from the front edge just to thin it down a little tiny bit You feel it sort of sticking into place it's exactly the right width um, now we're a little bit high now so what I can do is take some more material off here and basically it's a little tall at this base end so I will start by taking that down more than anything else and then aim to level it out we go. Okay, nearly there. It's a little bit confusing because that little hollowed edge there, but it's okay. Let's have a feel. Ouch. He spiked himself. <coughs> so the idea is you want to get this it locked in, fitted in, <coughs> excuse me, that fits in there nicely. But really you want it um, low enough so that the nut, no, yes, the nut, this one sits, it needs to sit low enough so that even with it screwed all the way down, the first, the strings sit on the first fret. And this at the moment I can see straight away is a little bit too high still. So I'm going to concentrate on um, getting this Take them down a bit more. It's very, it's quite difficult to get this exactly right. I mean, it's not that hard to get it exactly right, but it takes time and patience. So that's going to sit. Oh. Still too heavy, <coughs> too high I mean. So <clears throat> we can keep going. What what we hope to get is in the middle of the little thing, we want as much material underneath this as possible because we want the thing to stand on a fair amount of material. But you, you have to go down until you reach the correct operating height, otherwise uh, it won't work. So really have a lot of choice we have to still keep on going to reduce the height until it sits just right because we want upward adjustment more than anything else <clears throat> I think this uh, this bit of sandpaper now has kind of, kind of had its day now it's getting a bit worn out Nice, nice, all round. I think 
um, last time I made a set of these, I, uh, I experimented with putting some uh, resin into the mix to sort of give it a more cream colour. Um, and this one, I think I, you either get it a, a really creamy looking colour, in which case it doesn't, it, it matches, if you do it, it can match the, the binding, um, but on the other hand, it, it kind of doesn't match the nut itself, so it looks a bit odd. Okay, so <coughs> just looking at this, still too, still too high, too tall. Um, alternatives, I suppose, are to um, you can take take down the nut a little bit, um, so we can take down this side of this unit a bit. I think this is probably what I did with the previous one. Um, I've, I've actually gone and lost the... Where's it gone? Oh, here it is. Thank you. <laughs> um, so the other one, uh, I think I, I made it slightly lower, uh, lower slung so it would fit in. Is this a slightly bigger one? No, there you go. So it's a, it's a lower slung nut, that one. Um, in other words, I took a little bit off the base of this. We could do that here which gives us a little bit less of the supporting um, material but we take it off and let's get it flat on the ground we also get to flatten off the uh, flatten off the um, grub screw <coughs> bases as well which is good because that gives us a, a much more a much better footing I'm just taking this down a little bit. Let's have a look. Okay, so we're, what we're looking for, we just need enough material on there to support the thing. And it's this way around. It's this way, that way. That should still sit nicely in there, which it does. Um, it means we can take down this a little bit more. Very delicate little procedure, really, at this stage. Okay, what have we got? That's looking all right. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Excuse me, I have to get my blow my nose in a minute. So we've got a little space at the back, a bit more space at the back now, um, which is okay. And then we can just fit that in there like that, and then we can re look at the height it's still got some more distance to go down it's a very shallow nut this uh, this thing so that's the first thing and i'm not sure it's fitting all the way in there so i'm going to endeavor to just narrow it down just a fraction at the base here so we can fit it in stand it just just right inside this bit of Mm, poly. Okay, let's look. Is it sitting in there? No, this is a gap. It's too wide, a little bit too wide. This is a shame because we need to have it. Uh, we'll still come, we'll take it down the back a bit more. Oops. Okay, so basically, I'm trying to get this to fit this. Uh, gap properly so that it sits all the way in um, that's what we're aiming for so what I'm going to do before I do any more sanding <coughs> I'm gonna just be careful and do a little adjustment to the nut slot I want this to be as clean a fit as possible and if there's <laughs> if there's any glue sticking up here or anything getting in the way then it's going to and make things difficult. So just cleaning back the fingerboard, uh, sorry, the wood, this little bit of nut slot, and then just cutting it down right at the edge to make sure that it will fit. And that there's 
nothing getting in its way. I'm going to try this again. A little footing. So that's all this little piece is, a footing for the nut to stand comfortably in. And once we, if we get that in the right <coughs> place, that should sit down in there, that's nice. Okay, now that's sitting in there. So here we have it fitted properly. Now we're getting close. I'm just going to do up all the strings and just check how far off we are. And then we'll know exactly how much more, if any, we have to take off. A little bit high now on the treble end. So let's just check that seated. Yes, it is. Uh, let's just make sure we're dialed out to begin with so that there's no lift. So that's what I'm saying. We want to begin with the, the nut low enough that the strings sit on the first fret and then we'll use the adjustment part from there onwards because that's that's the whole point of fitting that. So with the with this nut, if you're putting new strings on, you want to tighten the strings from the center outwards. So the D and the G first and then outwards again. Otherwise it will just flip off. So we've got a little bit of movement there. It's nearly right but it's Oops, still, one way. still a little bit too high, but now we'll just take some off the bottom. Okay, adjustment down there is good. Um, if anything, we could probably, yeah, we can move it a little bit that way. But we've got to take it out and just remove a little bit more now. I'd say about half a millimetre at most. These nuts are just a fraction narrower than um, the often the the, the uh, nut slot, so they they're not a perfect fit in that sense. But they they do such a good job that it, I think it's worth doing. Um, let's get this on here so we can use this fresh bit of sandpaper. I can get it to stay in one place. So this is a sort of fiddly stuff at the very beginning of the setup. So it seems like a pain, but it's, it'll pay off. So I'm looking to remove about half a mil from here whilst keeping the bottom of the nut nice and flat. And so I want to go and just double check it and make sure that looks about right. I don't know how much I've taken away. So I'll just have to check check and then um, actually what I'll do is I'll, I'll use this. This happens to be a nicely freshly laid piece of sandpaper for this occasion. So I'll just sand this smooth 180 grit. There we go, just double check it. That looks good. Feels good. Let's get it in its little gap. A bit of rough stuff here too so I'll use a bit take some of that with there 80 grit or 60 grit I think this is okay let's have a look let's have a look straight 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 let's move it out stay still So like I say, it gets quite thin, or quite yeah, quite thin by the end of it. Um, but worth it when we get there. See, that's such a close fit, and we should be near, near the mark. Once we get it to sit flat on the frets, then basically we're just going up from there. So it, it takes a little time to get it right. We're being careful. Um, 
worth taking the time to get the height right because once we've done that the reason I want it right rather than putting it on cutting maybe cutting downwards with the, uh, the files for example which is entirely possible um, I don't want to do anything to these factory made slots that's in a way that's one of the things about the tusk nut we want to use the, the, the smoothness of the factory factory made slots because that's what keeps it keeps the tuning really well okay that's so close to being too far down so I'd say we're kind of just about on the, on the right mark there um, I mean it's above the mark um, but it's not so much I might, I might just do a tiny fraction more I always like it when we start directly on the string uh, on the fret because then we know we're, we're where we want to be So it would be nice if I could get these units made. Unfortunately, I have to do this sort of homemade version, and as, as you can see, it doesn't. Sometimes it doesn't come out perfectly finished, as in this edge, this little corner piece. But um, it's it's for me, it's the how well it works in keeping the guitar in tune, and that's the real important part for me the most it's actually a priority um, so I'm, I'm less worried about its look more its function that's the recommendation to do it okay smooth 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 a little dark on the back there smooth that off let's clean that up Okay, this should be the last bit. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this on here, and we can, if, nece oops, if necessary, we can um, glue it in later. But actually, it's going to probably stay in so well that it may not even need gluing, but we'll probably just do it just to get it spot on. And of course, because we've got the adjustment, we can always make a small adjustment if it changes. Right. I think we're, I can see them just about on the, on the frets. So middle, oh, I'll tell you what I'll do, while we're, while we're at it, let's undo that. Let's take these strings right off. In fact, let's loosen them a long way off because we want to change the bridge while we're at it. We need quite a bit of slack for that. So we're hoping that these strings stay inta intact for all of this process because we're playing the uh, we're playing the intonation game here. Okay, that, so those those are a little bit out of line. Let's I'm going to presume that Matted says it right in the first place. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring this back, start the sequence from roughly where it's set on the original, and I'm going to just reset it all slightly. We'll probably have to adjust it, but it's nice to kind of get it close to where you think it's going to be. Um, now I've turned it that way. It's probably the hardest way to adjust it. I should have done it this way, really, shouldn't I? Oh, middle, middle, middle. Let's let's run it from this side. We've got more access to it. There's no correct way. Um, some people get really picky about it, thinking that the the screws here should always face the uh, nut end of the guitar, but it isn't the case. They, they come in all different, well, some people put them one way, some people put the other, and there's no physical difference really at all. T particularly if you, um, the only thing that has a direction really is the little wedge shapes shaped saddles on the original bridges, and really they don't make any sense the way they're positioned usually as well. So. If you were going to change anything, I would pick up those little saddles and switch them all over. Uh, this is actually, in, uh, I don't know why I'm copying this, this is inter intonated quite quite incorrectly. So let's just put this on as if it was right. Off comes the old, and on goes the new, this time with the screws still facing forward. And oh, so it's a different, it's a different um, 
sized, what's it, roof posts. Uh, they should, they could just work straight using these, copying them. Uh, you, it would work with the original ones on, but there'd be a bit of movement, so you wouldn't necessarily want that. Oh, this is, hang on, this is exactly the same. Okay. Uh, I thought it was too small. I thought the whole, the, yeah, sorry, my mistake. Um, I was expecting them to be a little wider, but they're not, they're the right size. Right, let's get this low down, get the bridge on. There we have it. Put the rollers on. So it's a straight swap out, very easy to do. We'll put the um, middle on. A bit later, we'll take a look at the, the Dimasio because it's it's got some paper wedges in there to stop the pick up moving around so we could add some uh, sponge rubber to that to help it and stay a little bit more hidden <coughs> a bit more Consp conspicuous no it, you know the word subtle um, we've got plenty of bits of foam we can use for that right so this probably won't play now for a couple of reasons but certainly first of all because we should find that the strings are pretty much touching the first fret as we intended and that gives us the room now to adjust our playing action to where we want it okay get everything on there rollers okay it's just clear of the strings it's just about right actually I'll probably still need to take a fraction off. Can you believe it? Um, all right, we still aren't there on this. It's nearly there, but I like to touch the strings to begin with, so we'll go again <coughs> one more time. And we'll keep at it. Boring, isn't it? I could have just said, and then you do this until you have the exact height you want and then edit it and swing, it's done. But it isn't like that in the real world. It doesn't just happen. Right, I'm gonna lean forward a little bit, change the angle very slightly. Okay, and a bit more on this end. So these little nuts have a frontwards and a backwards, so they're quite easy to identify which is which. Um, the front edge is kind of thicker, or well, yeah, it's got more. I don't know what's the word. It's it's yeah, thicker, the front edge of the nut is thicker than the back edge. Okay, it's in place. And that's as close as it will get. There we have the nut in place. Right. <coughs> Just make sure that the spacing is right, which we can always tweak afterwards before we glue it down. And that, that's about right there. Middle strings first. Almost on the deck. We'll call it good for now. We'll work from this. Okay. Okay, so a couple of other little things. Let's have a look. I see, okay. 
I see one of the problems this has, and uh, mm, <clears throat> ah, interesting. Now somebody else had this problem before on their um, on their Harley Benton. It's it's the third time I've seen this problem now, it's one after another. <coughs> and the problem is uh, there is no further downward adjustment you can make. Um, no. They had that problem with this original bridge, which may be slightly uh, narrower than this one, but we've got the problem with the saddle, broken saddle, so we wanted to change it. So, we have to go backwards again. So this is a little detail. Now, with the, with the uh, original bridge, I think it was a fraction lower, and we can, we can measure it now in a second. We'll measure it just to be sure. But um, I have a feeling that this is a, a, re a repeat problem because uh, somebody on YouTube just asked me uh, a question about how exactly, how would I, <coughs> there goes the, the nut, how would I um, adjust or get any further lowering uh, of the action from this bridge. And <coughs> it looks like the angle and the bridge don't match. Now that's just a quick check. So height-wise, this is coming in at 8.5, and this will be a bit thicker. Okay, so this is 8.8, .8, so only slightly thicker. But even with this, if I put the original bridge back on, I think what we'll see is that there's a limit to the action we can set, especially if I recall on the base side. So let's just um, let's just get this back on. <coughs> Take a bit of time. This is this why I'd be very glad to be putting new strings on after all of this, because we're tugging these left, right, and centre, doing these experiments. So, uh, if if we have a basic problem with this guitar, meaning that we can't um, we can't actually get the, the kind of action we want at the bridge end because of the the angle and the actual height of the bridge studs, we've got a couple of options. Um, Now with this kind of bridge, actually we've got a few more options. If it was a single wraparound, we'd be a bit stuck. Okay, so with this on and everything crinked down as far as it will go, um, yep, we are... Okay, that, now that one, that bridge is... Okay, so it's sitting a little bit lower, um, which is good. Hmm. Well, and this is I'm kind of pretty much on the deck. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, first of all, let's lower this down and give this a bit more break angle. I'm very high at this end. bit better um, yeah so that that's actually a little bit higher sitting a little bit higher at this treble end um, and I think it's hard to see no they're both both the pegs or the studs are in <clears throat> that's exactly that's as low as it can go if we're going to use this one we might have to just modify the underside of here a little bit um, but yeah, it's funny that I've got a couple of questions at the same time about people who couldn't get the original bridges low enough. So there was some people have had some problem with that. Um, it's, it's okay on this original bridge, but we, we can't use it uh, because of the saddle movement. So we'll, we'll, we'll come to a compromise <coughs> with the bridge. Some more strings off again. So we get out of here and we'll do a little bit more measuring to double check what we've got going on. Okay, so a closer measurement. We have got 8.8 8 6 at that edge, and we've got 
8.8. So that's not a huge amount of difference. Same sort of drop underneath. Um, it's we we may well have a higher um, saddle tops are higher. That may well uh, the roll up tops may be higher. That's one thing. Um, what we don't have any option on is taking these down any further. Um, at an absolute push on another guitar, I've actually taken these off. Um, a guitar that I, I made and made a mistake with. Yeah, God, these have been screwed in too tight. Um, if you really had to, you can. There's a couple of things you can do actually. You can either um, you can very carefully sand these down, protecting the finish and everything around it. Um, and just take them almost back flush with the surface at an absolute um, outside push. Or, um, these aren't really thinnable, but you might find thinner versions. So, for example, this is, a, this is a thinner version as a start point. So I'm going to swap these over and gain about a millimetre. Um, or, if you were able to, you could pull these out and replace them with... Uh, um, threaded inserts which work really well and do the same thing and they happen to be or you can get them these are screwed in solid um, you can get them in m8 which is the same size as this metric eight um, and then you, you find that they will go all the way into the wood below the surface and it will still do the job of holding the bridge but you just don't see this this extra platform lip thing sticking out there so that's pretty good too but the, probably the simplest way, given that this is a, a 15 pound bridge, the simplest way, um, if we need to, is to take a bit of material from the underside of there with a file. So I'm just going to check this and see if we gained uh, anything, um, or how much we gained in that little movement there. <coughs> um, I mean, I, I don't mind making adjustments to a bridge when, um, you know, when, you, when you're talking 15 pound bridge it's, it's it's not like you're cutting down the original bridge on a gibson or something which you wouldn't want to do um, if you ever find yourself thinking you need to uh, adjust the underside of the this bridge area on a wraparound bridge it's difficult because it has the same construction as this and the minute you thin this down this has more, more room to move and it ends up riding up sitting up or tilting up at the back which isn't a very good look I mean it works but it's it's not great so there are quite a few little things you know sometimes it, it's not necessarily the idea but sometimes with a set neck guitar you find yourself kind of trapped in a corner where you haven't really got a, a choice and if you want to play the thing um, then you have to do that kind of repair or, or fix um, like I say, the threaded insert one, uh, often these Chinese guitars, the bushes for the bridge are only in very lightly and, and off, often they can be pulled out, in which case you've got free reign to, to replace with, a <coughs> with threaded inserts. Um, I, I could do that here, but the trouble with the threaded insert is it's a much more permanent fitting because it cuts and, and it's got little flanges on it, little fins that cut into the wood. Um, more so than, than these. These are just sort of pushed in, usually occasionally glued a bit. But. So let's just have a look. Okay, so um, right now, even with, see that's not, in, that's not quite where I want it at this end. I'll with you in a minute. More things to fiddle with. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I wouldn't necessarily be massively keen to use the um, threaded inserts unless it was, you know, a keeper, my guitar, and, and I was keeping it and I wanted to make a permanent change to it. A minute ago, I had that seated in beautifully. Now, why isn't it sitting in flush anymore? Flush anymore. Just a little feel here. No, for some reason that's not wanting to go in tidily. Just gonna do something. 
So, in a way, we haven't really even started this setup just yet. So, we have, but it, you can see it's a bit of a, a bit of pain going on here. But that's the price you pay. Okay, let's have a look at this. You want to fit in there, don't you? in there. Right, that's a, a better, a better fit, better fit, that's a better fit. <coughs> I just have to be a bit careful fitting it in. Right, bridge on, bridge on, bridge on. Right, so we don't know, quite know the height yet, and I'll just do a little measurement just to, now to get a, a better idea. Here those now touching the first which is where it should be sitting, which is good. First fret, and I still want it, thank you. Okay, now down at this end, we're at full low, and we have got a height of, well, Yeah, a bit too high. So we're a fraction too high with this bridge. Um, so it has its benefits. Um, what I would do is we are we are half a millimetre above where I want it to be. So the only real alternative is to sort it out. a millimeter too thick on here and um, we've taken a little bit off by changing these but still a fraction too much and the only way we're going to re reduce it any further is to sand it down sorry file it down and the only way we're going to file it down is to get it in the clamp in the clamp in the vise and um, we could possibly do it with uh, that thing we've got a got this thing here which could probably work some of it down and um, see how long that would take. Quite effective and it stops me having to having to um, put it in the vise. Which I uh, prefer not to do. Come on, come around here. Sorry about this. A temporary thing. But sort of vaguely flat using this device, but it's not quick. But you can measure it. Uh, let's just check the other side. So we were on 8.7 and we're about the same currently on there. A little bit less there. So it's not a quick process. Really. So the thing about making an adjustment from the underside here is once you do that you won't see it when the bridge is in place. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a way of getting some extra space out of it. Um, you can also get your uh, 
file onto it if you want to. And it will rip it to pieces like that. That's your sandpaper gone. difficult to do. 8, 7, 8, 4, 8, 5, 7, 9 on that side. So we've got we don't want to do that. We don't want to do that. We want to take some of this off manually. sanding disc because this is job done. In a way the uh, the gauge is your best friend at this point as this is what's going to tell you where you are. enough off each side. Eight three, eight three, eight two. It's, it's not perfect, but um <clears throat> once you've got the roughly the right amount on each side, then you're ready to go. And then what I do is a little, a little edge softener um, so you don't have any burrs. And you'll never even notice a thing. Okay, so that's down to 8.15 or something like that. So it's about half a millimeter down. I'm going to do the same here with this one, straight in with the file. And again, it's you know you're trying to get it as as straight as you can, but but it's difficult. With a thin layer of chrome, it cuts very easily, really. You know, the, uh, the chrome sort of puts up a fight for a minute or two, um, but then 
quickly surrenders. Surrenders your alloy to the ravages of the file. Not far off really. And you know, having held it by hand, there's no marks on the top. It's tempting to put it in a vise because you can get a load more force into it, but <coughs> you can quickly turn what up till that point is a you know a fairly subtle job into something that. Uh, then it will end up looking quite uh, quite a mess. It can end up looking quite a mess. There you go. Now where's the sharp edge? Is it still on that side or that side? I've forgotten that. Uh, I either really. Okay, let's put those out of the way. Let us brush off. A little bits of the alloy. <coughs> right, back to square one. Let's get the bridge back in. Okay, let's go. Let's go from here. So let's imagine we're back to the beginning nearly. And we're going to just tighten up the middle strings first. Remember that each time. Secure the nut, the adjustable nut part, by doing up the middle strings first. And away you go. And then that's going to be in place and held there. It won't jump out and go anywhere. just over one, about 1 1.2 so that's a fraction under what I'd want so it gives me a bit of upward <coughs> upward movement which is great so let's just do that now I'm just going to turn this fractionally upwards um, and get me the 1.2 1.5 at this end so it hardly needs any let's just pile it back in a tiny bit pull up 1.5 and then call that 1.2-ish down at the bottom end, we'll leave that where it is. Okay, now <coughs> let's get this up to, roughly up to pitch. Now we can hear it hitting already, so let's do the first adjustment on here. So we dial in the rising, the height, the lift we want, a little tiny bit. See already there's a little bit low, so I'm going to raise them up a tiny bit too. Now we've got the control, which is great. So now we have <coughs> strings back on <coughs> doing their job. We've got 
we've got the um, both the nut end now and the um, it's not quite sitting where I want it to. Damn it! We can come back and readjust this afterwards. We'll do for now. Um, we've got everything kind of sitting where we want it to, and we're just stretching out the strings a bit. Now you won't hear any pinging from the nut end. That's the beauty of the tusk. So now we have the nut and the bridge kind of where we want them. We've got zero relief on the neck and I think it needs a tiny little bit. No matter how cool it is to have a very flat neck. I think it needs a little bit of relief. So I think um, these are tens, I believe, or they might be nines. So let's let's slack it off a little bit and just see if we can. Oh, actually, yeah, we'll give it a little bit of relief. This is, it says it has a two-way truss rod. It's very little. Very little. Let's do a tiny bit more. <coughs> So what we're what I'm looking for at this point in time now is I'm getting the three components of the setup finalized. The first fret action by the nut, the last fret action by the bridge, the new bridge, and the neck relief by the truss rod. I'm getting those three right. Okay, so now we've got the action where I want it. A little bit of relief. We're looking at a last fret action of, actually it's a fraction over, so I'm going to dial this tiny bit further in. In fact, it's right down to its limit, so we're pretty much exactly where I want to be. Maybe I might have even taken a little bit more when, when I next take this off, but But overall, and again, that's slightly high too, so we may still want to take a little bit off. Yeah, there's no more downward. <coughs> Might want to take a little bit more off the other side of that. Um, because actually at the moment, that's not going to get us into the exactly where I want it to be. Um, uh -huh. So I'll do this off camera because it's getting boring. <laughs> more boring. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a small adjustment to a bit more filing on there and take it so I've got a range of movement including downwards to where I want it to be. Um, and then when I've done that I'll come back and we'll assess the frets then because it's, it's a matter of getting all of the action components right first um, and then <coughs> assessing the playability of the frets. Now at the moment at about 1.5 or 1.75 millimeters on the last fret. Um, that high E has got enough clearance. Um, before, when we had the other bridge on, it was set lower, so it didn't have enough clearance and it was buzzing out, or buzz, certainly buzzing out the bend, which we didn't want, and so it would have required um, some adjustment, possibly fret, a slight bit of fret leveling up there. However, until we get this bridge down to the same level, we won't know. So that's the next. <coughs> Job. and I'll do it off camera so see you in a bit. Okay right finally got that filed down. Um, what am I looking for? What I'm looking for this. 
So I'm going to, while I'm at it, I, even though these are old springs, I'm going to test, or check the intonation prior to um, doing any more work on this, and then we can get the bridge pretty much positioned where we want. I've got the bridge now at exactly the right action that I want, which is um, about uh, 1.2 on the high E, and uh, 1.5 on the low E. Okay, so that tells me this is a bit far back. So, oh, that's not on the string properly, that doesn't help. Try again. That's the thing about the rollers, you've got to make sure it strings on them. Okay, still a bit um, flat, which means the string's too long. And that means I'm going to bring the uh, saddle forwards. Now this is not the easiest thing in the world to do. In fact, it's an impossible thing to do. Let's see if we can get a bit better access to it. Hmm, yeah, just about. It's still not very high, so we're kind of <laughs> struggling. If I can get this one done, then I can line up the others. Nearly there. So these poor old strings have done some great service in getting this thing set up. Um, they really have kind of struggled. So I think if I just get this one here, we're pretty much on target with this one. And I can set all the other ones by eye. There you go, spot on. Okay, so the, I'm, take, I'm going to leave that as is. I don't care about the intonation from here. I'll adjust all the other ones in line when the uh, bridge is off again, once we've done any work. But now, the interesting point now... Okay, so this has some problems here. problems in the top basically up here on this top E and over here on the low A. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get the strings off and I think I might do this tomorrow. No I'll do the leveling tonight and I'll do the rest tomorrow. I'm going to mark off the frets and um, we'll do a very light fret leveling and I'll use my Stumac U channel to do this one, and then it doesn't matter if it gets the pen gets on the strings because these are going in the bin shortly. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's amazing that the strings have lasted this well to get all this done. So as you can see from this, um, when the action was set really low on the previous bridge, it was high on the bass side, low on the treble side, and as low as it was on the treble side, it was choking out on some bends. Now my target action here is as low as I would put any of those pull. So it's about 1.2 millimeters on the last fret. It was too low before that. So um, that it's, it's not, oh, it's not, um, yeah, we didn't want. We couldn't really reasonably have it that low. I've never gone that low with a, a Les Paul, possibly with an SG. But um, so at a at a good low action, um, we've still got a little bit of unevenness 
a slight, um, slight bit of a low fret actually. Um, so we are going to do a very light, light leveling. Uh, if I can remember where it's all gone now, my new, slightly new arrangement. Uh, yes, so we will do it. We'll do it right now. Now this has this has an interesting thing because I know that the I know that these uh, mother of pearls are fractionally below the level of the wood. So I have to take that into account when I'm doing this leveling. And those beady-eyed people amongst you will recognise that ah, that's going to affect your your reading and your truss rod um, as of now. So I'm aware of this. It's not on this one, it will do it will be on the next ones, but so I'm gonna bear that in mind as I do the leveling. And you, you're going to say, well how are you gonna bear it in mind, Sam? Exactly what way do you bear it in mind? And I'll tell you I don't really know. Being absolutely honest with you, I'm just gonna bear it in mind. So on the first one, we're on the same uh, you know we're on at the same curve now and I'm just going straight on and seeing what our prep leveling file tells us about the state of this high E track. And a quick look tells me cutting everywhere, there, not there, so it's kind of reckon there's a couple of low frets there. Cutting, 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 missing those. So it's got um, low frets there, a couple of low frets there, but everything else is cutting. Um, now, the great thing about this is this method, as I said a billion times before on these videos, you can now put the string back in and the beauty is you can now test it. Okay, I've got a low fret followed by what's a, actually a high fret. So that one there is causing the problem. Now we'll pay that a little bit more attention and lo and behold, it's already cut up a little bit anyway, showing that it's, it's clearly high. Clearly high. Yes, it's definitely high and it's standing out as high, which is great because the, the cutting, the evidence of the truss rod leveling file is confirming what we knew anyway, and that we were hearing it um, getting in the way of the note at that low action. Now, now a Les Paul should be able to play at that action, and this one is showing us cutting up a fair bit and nothing off these two immediately afterwards. So maybe the factory has put a fall away at this last five frets, maybe not, but they are lower than everything else at the moment. There you go. So that's cured that, and you heard it with your own ears, and that's what's great about this method, is you don't have to imagine what you're doing, it just does it right there and then. You are, you are hearing it with your own ears. What am I doing? <laughs> I'm getting confused. I'm going to move the B string out of the way. And I'm going to use the same setting for the B string. So I will just go straight in and level. And I'm going to need to recalibrate when I do the G track. And that's where it's going to, going to risk dropping the little brass nuts into the, the mother of pearl, which we don't want to have happen. So we've got cutting heavily there, cutting more heavily here on this one. So there's a difference in levelness going across, as we kind of expect, because it's fairly normal. Now, fine. Now we're getting a little bit of zizz as we go into the G. From this fret here, whatever it is, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 fret, right? Now watch what happens when we level this next, the G track, we want to see that 17th fret bend on the E even out. It won't disappear maybe, but we should be able to get it reduced if not disappeared. Now, this is the bit that you might say, oh, hang on a minute, you've got a, in the fret you normally use, you've got a, a what's it? Well, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go one side to there, I'm going to push that next to there, I'm going to grab that there, I'm going to go double that, and I'm going to put one right on the end here. I'm going to hope that's close enough. And lo and behold, anyway, it's just a little bit over, over curved. But that's very close. It just needs an even spread across the truss rod um, that you're leveling with the file. And there we go, we have it. So we've avoided putting the string, uh, the, putting the nuts, brass stone nuts, into one of those ditches, in inverted commas. Now, 
remember this is the one when we level out this fret up here we're expecting to hear that E bend just clean up as we get across into that track. Now there are people who I know watch these videos and they go I've just taken my Harley Benton out of the box and it's fantastic and that's absolutely fine when, when it's somebody who is happy with the action that they ship with. And if you are, okay, if you are happy with the action that it ships with, then great. Um, nobody's criticizing you or saying you shouldn't be. Um, all that I'm saying here is that customers who come to me and ask me to set a low action on their Harley Bentons uh, need that bit of extra fret leveling that you might not need. And that's all there is to it. Um, it's not right or wrong. It's just, that's a choice. It's a service that somebody wants. And some people get quite humpy about it, you know. They seem to find it's... There you go. So we've cleared it up. You heard that one clear up with your own eyes. You know what I mean. Okay, now we're onto the D track and onwards. Now again, this one is going to try and go off the end of there. Oh, it's trying to go into the, the ditch, shall we call it. And let's see, yeah, we'll just go right to the end there. So we've missed the mother of pearls and we've got a pretty good, we're still getting a pretty good approximation of the curve on this neck, the relief curve. Um, yes, yeah, so you know, people people can, you know, they can get just really, you know, that thing where they can't, they, they don't have empathy and they, they, they lack basic empathy. So what they, they do is they can only see through their own experience, and therefore, if it's good for them, anyone else who says it isn't good for them must be stupid, and therefore they make it a point to tell them and what they don't get. They don't have that amazing thing that you get when you are a bit more mature and that is you recognize that different things work for different people and your point of view about the world this one's very high your point of view about the world isn't universally applicable to everyone else and part of being a little bit mature more mature and more humble is a recognizing that fact um, and it's a uh, it's kind of funny when you when you see people who just can't do it it's that's absolutely beyond them uh, to to conceive that somebody else's experience may be at least as valid in fact for them more valid than your experience so and these people you, you keep seeing them they come and tell you no that's wrong that's wrong you go, no it works absolutely fine for me no but you're wrong no and you just keep on you kind of, I'm afraid to say, you, I know what kind of life they lead and the way they relate to people from just that. And, and I'm, you know, I'm glad I don't have those kind of people around me. Full stop. Anyway, so in the, to keep it from rescue it from the esoteric, it's it's this thing about action is a very good example of how quickly people can just misread, misunderstand that, or lack the basic empathy to, to understand that other people want something different from what they want. And so um, I know that Mattitz wants this guitar to play low. My job will be to make it play low. And uh, I shall do so, despite some people thinking that that's an impossibly low action to set on a guitar and I must be stupid and or very wrong etc because that's tough and uh, the proof of the pudding is I still get plenty of people watching my videos and sending guitars to me as a result of it and they know full well uh, the kind of action I set in these setups and they um, damn, they uh, to send the guitars to me for that exact action. So if you're not one of those people, that's cool. You carry on playing your action just the way you want it and there's nothing wrong with that. But try to hold yourself, ring yourself in from telling other people that that action's wrong and only somebody stupid would play with an action like that. Because 
it ain't true. Right, just make sure this E string now plays. We've got the basic precision part of the setup done. Now this at the moment is sitting very low as it settles in. Um, this is sitting low, so I'm going to just bring this back up a little bit on the high, the high E, and then turn a bit on the low E, and we're we're good. I can stay where it is. All right, so we're done. I'm going to stop for now. We're going to leave this overnight. We'll come back, and tomorrow I'll get on with the um, polishing out, and then. That's pretty much the precision bit of the, fret, uh, of the setup done. Because what's nice about that method is that once you can take all the strings off now, you can reprofile. I might do that just before I finish, but we'll. He says, Is he ever going to turn it off? Um, once, you, once you've done the setup like this, the fret leveling, um, next time you restring this guitar, the neck will return to that same basic position. Or configuration and the frets will return to the same relative levelness which is a brilliant part of this setup so I'm just gonna unstring it we'll do the recrowning now and then we'll re uh, polish out the frets tomorrow now I'm kind of leave trying to leave the middle one of the middle strings on as the last ditch so that the the uh, nut doesn't go pinging off all over the wall. Hold the nut down and then kind of restring the same way. It's worth keeping that in mind. This will jump off, fall off, and that's fine. And if you find that it changes the way it's set, then of course you can also um, uh, adjust it. Where's that sticking? Oh, I forgot to undo that one. No wonder the bridge wouldn't come off. Um, yeah, if. if if you uh, if you find that anything's changed in the way it's seated, then you can you can readjust it um, with the little screws. Um, it's pretty much going to be all done. Won't need, won't need adjusting. Okay, so the last step for tonight is I'm just going to remark these, and we're going to just round off any flat spots caused by the fret leveling using the crowning file. And this file is very handy because it does that job without causing any further reduction in the height of the fret. And that's a critical bit because having gone to that length to get the frets level, now we want to um, clean them up in terms of their shape. We don't want them to be flat topped, um, but we don't also we don't want to risk lowering them at all. So this convex, sorry, concave file um, allows me to kind of run over the top of the fret and it takes away any shoulder on the fret, softens off any sharp shoulder where the flat spot meets, meets the edge and um, providing I stop while there's still some marker pen, and that's what the marker pen's for, um, then it basically, I leave a thin as possible strip marker pen down the middle of the fret. Um, as long as I leave some marker pen then I pretty much haven't adjusted the top of the fret at all. I've just done the edges, I've rounded off the edges, and that means that I haven't then adjusted anything about the levelling that we just spent a good time doing. And so, um, what you'll see is, if you try this method, what you'll find is that the length of time you spend on this part of it is always a good guide to how much or how little levelling you actually did. And sometimes, or always actually, when you start using this method, you'll think, oh my god, I've taken tons, I've killed my frets. And the fact is that's the worst one here, that's the one we took most off, so I've spent the longest time on it so far, and that'll be the longest time probably I spend on any of them. Um, and so it's, it's, it's the amount of time you spend doing this will, you, you'll think you've taken tons off your frets, and then you'll pretty much whiz through here and you go, oh, I hardly took any at all actually. Um, and it sort of helps you to, if you do this method, it helps you to sort of get comfortable with 
how much and how little you're actually taking off when you're doing the fret leveling because I think if you're like me most people probably get scared off and, and probably stop earlier rather than later when they do their first fret levelings with this method because you, you can you always you always tend to err on the side of having done more leveling than less you think you've done more um, and so part of the secret of the technique and developing the experience is, is to be able to know that you haven't done so much and that you need to carry on to get the, the right um, get the action right because the thing you don't also want to do is end up giving back uh, a guitar where you haven't leveled out any uh, you know you've, you've left some unevenness in and yet you've set the action very low and then the customer gets it back and uh, it still has a buzz or something which isn't great and, and I've, it's happened a couple of times and I realize you know, I often realize it's happened because I whipped out on the leveling um, so and sometimes it's why I, I might end up doing a second level on some guitars where I just I get it done and then I play it um, and then I say to myself no nope, chicken out here this needs a little bit more and I go back and do it and the rewarding part is that you you know you then hear it sort itself out and it's just the way you want it there's a downside there's a risk I should say in setting very low actions and that is while um, a lot of customers like it that way uh, the risk can be that when you work with an extremely low playing action with very little tolerance at all um, you can make you can get it so low that uh, you run the risk of even the slightest environmental change um, causing you to drop your action or causing the action to drop down low enough or just below the level that the frets are the action that the frets are leveled for and what you find is a buzz can creep back in and it's it's a it's a it's, it's a victim of the success if you like of, of being able to set low actions so sometimes when I I've, in the past I've caught myself thinking maybe because uh, let's say a customer's guitar came in and the nut was already set to point at first rate action of 0.25 and I go oh go on I'll just do all the others to 2.5 and I've gone ahead and done that um, and my instinct says no that's too low don't do it don't do it and I've gone ahead and done it and then they take it home to their air-conditioned house or something or their centrally heated house a tiny bit of change happens in the neck and because we're already low you suddenly you might find we've suddenly got buzzing on the first fret and, it, and that's if you've got an adjustable nut that's fine but if it was a standard one you know you're in a, a crappy position you don't want to be in so my when I find myself tempted to overcook it as I call it um, I try and stay away so you know heading if, if I'm feeling any nervous at all, I'll stick at 0.4 over the first fret instead of 0.3. And I certainly won't go below 0.3 anymore because it's it's just not worth it. And the same applies to the action at this end. You know, I know that 1.2 and 1.5 are good playing actions for any guitar like this. Um, I won't go below that because it's no good for me or the customer. If anything changes in their environment, they get a guitar they can't play. And you know, expecting them to make adjustments at the other end, you know, is it okay, it's good if they learn how to and stuff, but you know, when they've just paid you and you've set it up, and then the central heating causes it to drop a half a millimeter or, or a tenth of a millimeter, and it doesn't sound so good, you know, that there's nobody just because it doesn't do anyone any good that you can say to them, ah, oh, that's the central heating affecting the neck. It's just better not to go that close to the tolerance full stop. Okay, um, tomorrow I'll come back to this, finish this off. Um, everything's done the underside of the bridge is like that um, nobody will see it it does its job this will go back with the guitar as well in case he wants to sell it um, but right now for playing this is on there and for 15 quid it's an improvement that means you know the strings are going over rollers for a start um, and then at this end you've got a, an adjustable nut that um, kind of almost better than anything it allows you to use the factory slots at the right height and that's something you actually can't get when you're doing um, when you're cutting your own nut slots even in tusk even though it's a good material you can get it pretty good and you know it, it's still never quite as good as using the preformed factory slots particularly with a, a company like Graph Tech whose 
pretty much whose whole job is making friction-free uh, nuts and various other parts. And so, and so you know, the, their slots in their nuts are worth fighting for, if you get what I mean. It doesn't, you know, if I if I can get the right first fret action without um, mangling or you know physically uh, attacking their nut slots, I want to do it because their nut slots are made by a machine that's designed to make a very smooth slot, whereas my my um, nut files are ragged saws, basically. Ragged saws, that sounds terrible. Some horrible hospital treatment needed. Um, but you know what I mean. So, uh, but the problem is, uh, more important than whether the slots are smooth or ragged, is the first fret has to be the right, the first fret action has to be right. And so I have to get that whatever happens. Now, the, this is what the great thing about these adjustable nuts is, that it's the first time I've been able to get exactly the right first fret action without having to do any fi uh, nut filing or slot filing. And, you know, like I said, I've got pretty good at it in my, you know, I know how to get them, I can get them so that they stay in tune and, you know, but it's still never quite as easy or as simple or as free of problems as the original slots that t Graph Tech make on these things that they've been manufacturing with their computer aided design for years. So, you know, you pay money for the Graph Tech. So I absolutely want to use the best aspect of what they do, which is the nut slots. And so because I can make an adjustable base or make a base that allows me to use this in an adjustable way, that then frees me up to first for the first time really to use the um, the beauty of the factory made slots. Now it, you'll see that even if even if I um, use, uh, if, if I were to fit a, a, a regular tusk nut to somebody's guitar, and I, I didn't want to want to mine the other day, a strap, um, and I to get those actions, I, I got as close as I could from below, and uh, then I had to cut down to get the exact action. And I have to tell you that um, even though I got the action right and it plays great, it's still you know, cutting into the material, and you know, if you looked under the microscope, you would see that the uh, the, the nut files are fairly ragged. You know, they're fairly crude tools. So, like I say, the best thing of all would be able to just, however it happens, to be able to use the um, the factory-made slots. And of course, this is uh, this allows you to do it. This adjustable thing. That's you know, really pleased to have kind of figured it out when I first saw uh, first saw them producing these things. I realised um, I realised that there was an option to do it. Okay, so I've got a set of tens here, which is great for using as sacrificial strings another time. Always handy to have. Um, but we will have new tens to go on tomorrow. Early, early, early borns, early borns, borny elves, early boards. Early doors. Um, yeah, then see you tomorrow. Uh, got to polish these out still. So what I'm going to do, just so I don't run the risk of coming in and thinking I'm ready to restring it, I'm just going to go like that, so I know that tomorrow I finish that job. Okay. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow. Now I've been um, listening to the rate. Sorry, I, I'm so so terribly terribly sorry. I've been listening yonder radio. Um, <laughs> Will this thing stay up? Mm -hmm. Listening to the radio, and um, I know that uh, YouTube doesn't like anyone talking about serious subjects because that will upset its advertisers. So this would probably end up picking up, uh, picking up a strike or whatever they call it, demonetization. But I don't care. Um, we are what appears to be in the grip of a pandemic of the coronavirus or COVID-19. Um, disease, the disease caused by the coronavirus. Anyway, um, and <coughs> here in the UK, and I, this is political, so yes, I will get demonetized because that's what YouTube's like, but anyway. Um, here in the UK, there's very little credible <coughs> and coherent leadership on this issue. And that isn't just because, um, you know, just because, I don't know, 
know what, just because it's the Tory government, blah, blah. It's just that it seems to be an attitude of, I kind of, it's a bit like Trump in a way, you know. Um, don't worry, we've got, we've, we've spent loads of time sitting in boardrooms and we've come up with some whiteboard plans, A, B, C and D cases, you know, and, and we're good at doing that and, you know, we always have these things mapped out. So <clears throat> just trust that we've got it mapped out. Oops, sorry. And that's that. And it'll all be all right because guess what? We're British. <clears throat> and that's how it's going to be. And of course the news this morning is going on about the tragedy of the first British person to die as a result of COVID-19. Um, I yeah, like it doesn't matter so much that millions of Chinese have died, not millions, sorry, certainly thousands, um, possibly a lot more if you believe many Chinese government critics or critics of the government and their truth on us anyway. It's neither here nor there. Uh, people have died. But there's one British person that's known to have died, so therefore it's terrible. Um, and so we're in that strange place where nobody in the UK that I know knows what to do. And everybody's just sort of waiting for something to happen. And of course, the only thing they're waiting to happen is for the virus to take off here. So there's, there's people ringing in radio stations saying there's absolutely no serious or significant or even meaningful checks <coughs> at uh, airports, Heathrow and so on. People just piling on in and uh, nobody's being checked. Um, you know, apparently if people ring up the, um, call up the health service and whatever, um, and, and have symptoms. Apparently, there have been reports that there's been some fairly good responses to that, and people have got checked out pretty quickly. But um, that's a sort of that's a very skewed thing because that's self-reporting, obviously, um, self-diagnosing or self-isolating. There's people who know, and one of the problems with this, as everybody knows, this whole thing's completely messed up by the fact that um, this virus is uh, infectious can be transferred even in uh, even from people who are asymptomatic have no symptoms at all so this business of uh, just responding to and or quarantining people who are symptomatic or even worse not just symptomatic but have felt worried that they've got this virus and therefore identify themselves to the authorities health authorities <clears throat> the idea that that approach is somehow going to um, protect blimey, a lot of wiring going on in there. So the idea that's going to protect uh, us in any way is ridiculous. So I'm just taking out the paper, by the way, that Matic to, uh, Matic's has put in here <coughs> to try and stop this swinging around. And I'm, what I'm going to do is I'll replace it with a little bit of uh, foam. It's got a little wiring in this cavity. So no, no main major problem <clears throat> but it does feel a little bit on the full upside now the problem with these if you put some rubber in here or some foam um, this tends to just fall fall down straight away uh, it drops down the side so you never know now if, assuming this is the setting he wants for this super distortion what really we need to do is figure out what the get the gap under there is now if I just pull this back a little bit get the wiring back through so we've got a bit of room and we've got a, a hole down there which the what's its drop into. It is nice Demasio, look, look at that, made in the USA. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get a bit of I'm gonna get a bit of foam and cut it to this size and use that. And I hope it's the right sort of size for this. And we'll just put it on there and that will compress down now just to be on the nice side we'll 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 try and cut it at least straight. Anyway, um, yeah, so so here we are in the UK, sort of assuming that it couldn't happen to us because we are British, and therefore we'll, we'll somehow it'll all just work out beautifully. And um, that's very good, but it's not the case. The virus doesn't have any respect for Britishness. And um, so 
I, I think many others, are fairly well convinced that we're going to be hit very hard. Um, now the thing about that is, the question is, uh, you know, the, the, the reality is, is, is if I'm making a, a, a reasoned judgment based on lo logic, what I would say is I have no confidence at all that anything that the British government has done at this point is, um, is going to prevent the spread of coronavirus in the UK um, because of just simply because of these things of there's no really credible prevention there's no shutting down of flights there's no cancelling of events and of very few if any <clears throat> so the whole thing is wide open um, that means it's gonna it, it is here it's gonna trans it's gonna multiply um, and there's no shutting down locking down of towns and cities to prevent it and the, the, the thing that's interests me about this whole thing. Now that's a big chunk of, that's a big old chunk of foam. And we may well find that this doesn't want to fit back in here at all now. Um, actually, you know what? look at that, it does. Funny, let's put that down. <coughs> yeah, so it is here, the virus is here, um, and the government is not showing, hasn't shown and isn't showing any inclination to do any of the things that um, logic would tell you would go some way towards preventing uh, spread the way this virus has spread in China and so you know expect it and uh, you know it's gonna it's gonna multiply here now the thing that if there's one thing that worries me really uh, well there's a couple of things one is that you know we haven't got any Incredible leadership on this issue, and it just feels—it <coughs> feels really, really noticeable by its absence. Look at that; that's beautiful. What a job! Um, yeah, very noticeable by its absence. This absence of leadership, um, and it's not even political. It's something British, you know. That the politicians just think, but you know, they're, they're somehow it'll all work out if they just get up and go to work and say the right things to the press and this and the other. Well, it isn't going to work out that way for those reasons. The virus is not going to respect that activity. So, the thing that worries me is that it will definitely spread, and it's here, and it will continue to spread here. <coughs> the thing that worries me is that it's known to be dangerous to <coughs> to uh, your health as you get older, as your immune. So, those with weaker immune systems are vulnerable to it. And the case fatality rate goes up very quickly, uh, very substantially as, as you get into the older age groups, my age and older, or even before my age, um, especially where people have what they call comorbidities, he said using his newly acquired doctor's jargon, but you know what I mean, other things wrong with you, right? Um, so that's a worry because well, I don't have anything's wrong with me but I am of the older in the older age bracket of course um, but the thing that really bugs me about the whole deal is that the British government is behaving as though it tr absolutely trusts the Chinese figures um, when credible but nonetheless anecdotal uh, first-hand information is coming out of China, which convinces people that I've been following, authorities or experts that I've been following, convinces them that the Chinese numbers are grossly understated, and so that uh, the people on the street in China are more, much more likely to say that the numbers involved are in the, in the tens if not hundreds of thousands of dead nationally. Um, and judging by the Chinese response, you kind of can't help but think that's a very uh, a possible, um, credible assessment. Um, now that means that if the government in this country is, is behaving as if the Chinese numbers are accurate, as given to the World Health Organization, um, then you might say, oh look, you know, let's take a huge country like China, and in the entire one billion people we've had, let's say, nearly 3,000 or coming towards 3,000 deaths. That's statistically 
insignificant and of course you wouldn't worry about it. You'd say it's a flu and it's a little bit more like anything else. But the real issue is exactly whether or not that information is credible. And I have no understanding or confidence why the British government is accepting this most critical of information as credible, wherein it won't accept anything else that the Chinese government says is credible. And so I just think this is a hugely dangerous point. Um, anyway, so uh, on the plus side, um, in, from personal level, oh, look at this, loose loose switch. I have to take care of that as well. Um, oh, loose knobs, uh, loose buttons, straps. Anyway, we'll take care of this. Yeah, so um, just on the plus side, or on the what can you do about it side, um, it's very limited what you can do. And from my perspective, um, we're sort of relatively lucky well, lucky. We're relatively less. Uh, our vulnerability is quite a bit less because we live in in the countryside, southwest of the UK, and we very rarely spend much time, if any, uh, with great crowds of people in the bustling travel hotspots like London or you know, major capitals. Um, so, if you wanted to feel like your best bet for avoiding infection. Um, one, probably the top thing on your list would be to avoid large groups of people, or even as you know, avoid as much as possible being with any groups of people in this period of time. That's got to be your first and most significant line of defence. Um, then, if if you are and when you are around people. Then the best, next best thing um, is to be very consciously not putting your hands anywhere near your mouth or any other wounds or mucus areas. <laughs> Sorry to be disgusting. Um, so you, if you have it on your hands from being out and about, then you either try and wash it off as best you can with sort of surgical style washing, or um, after that, um, and can, as well as um, so those hand cleaning gels, which are, by the way, only bacterial, antibacterial in their basic function. But um, they, some people think that they help to guard against um, viruses as well. I'm not sure. But one of the things they do say is that. Uh, if you are infected by this virus, you do stand the risk of, when you're being ill, having secondary bacterial infections, so you, you'd like to limit those as well. Um, from what I've heard, despite half the world queuing around the block for them, I've, the word on the street, uh, consensus, is that masks aren't really very useful at all, and certainly, certainly aren't likely to save you if you're in close proximity uh, to the virus, because um, it's almost impossible to seal the masks completely. Uh, they get full sense of security, people move them, take them off, touch them, they've got virus particles, you know, DNA on them, RNA, sorry, and so on and so on, and end up getting infected anyway. So, washing out the five million of them probably isn't very useful. Also, don't forget that the British are, the British are very reluctant to stand out. So <clears throat> I don't can't imagine how late in the day it will need to be before the first Brit gets out the uh, mask in public and gets seen to be um, carrying it, uh, wearing it, because it's going to be very. It will be very late in the day for us British people.
Uh, and presumably far too late in the day. Anyway, so um, my plan for this is to keep the hygiene as thorough as possible, avoid big crowds, um, and actually, yes, stock up on some tin stuff that will keep you going for a month in kind of lockdown rations if that's what happens. But why not? Who wouldn't? Um, you know, you can only use it up if it doesn't happen. So, in a way I feel quite, quite lucky to be being able to work in my shed, which is obviously nobody else here but me. But you know, either which whichever way this goes, um, I think one thing that a lot of people here are, are struggling with is the complete absence of Boris Johnson or any guiding figure giving us credible or even what sounds to us like credible information. Uh, you know, and we watch something like um, a weekly political question, well, question time program, and you watch that and you hear the same, or you hear the standard politician answers, or non-answers. So, I had a, a Tory politician on last night, and a question was put about, you know, given that we, given that the Conservative government um, cut back the number of nurses, blah, 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 bit of a political point, but um, given that we're short now, massively short of nurses, uh, and the National Health Service is, is creaking at its seams, and, and that the waiting lists are already enormous for surgery and so on and so on, um, what, what assurance do we have that the government is ready to um, suddenly increase the number of uh, nurses to deal with this far less intensive care beds which there are absolutely never going to be enough of you know, and the politician gave absolutely no credible reassurances that left anyone in the audience convinced at all and that's the climate that we live in here I think this is it it's as if our politicians have so long lived in this fake world of meetings and whiteboards and you know projections and and what they call PowerPoint decks and so on and everything's just talk and they've come to mistake that for real life and so the average person has no real confidence at all not only that that we're in any way ready for this but has no confidence, confidence at all that there's even sufficient intelligence at work or available to deal with it. It's not even like there's anyone with a... You don't even trust that there's anyone in government that has a clear overview of the problem. And that's really depressing. in this country in a climate where being being concerned and pre prepared I suppose um, over the last few years has become it's become rephrased as this thing called project fear you know where to be concerned about possible worst case or bad case middle worst semi worst case outcomes and to be prepared for them is to be uh, a project fear person. You're just, you're just being hysterical. Suck it in and get on with it. You know, blah blah blah. Man up, or whatever they say. Um, and in a way, that's affected politics too, in in respect of this crisis. You know, and there's a kind of sense. There's a sense, and I can't prove it, but there's a, a feeling 
that our politicians <laughs> know that there's not a chance in hell that we can cope with uh, an outbreak if it's any bigger than the Chinese government have told us. But you can bet your bottom dollar it is. Uh, the politicians know that we can't deal with that. And you get the feeling that privately they're they know that they can't change that in this immediate short term and they just have to let it play out and see how many people die. <coughs> My worry is what's going to be proven to them too late is that the Chinese weren't telling the truth. That the on the street reports from the very brave people who've actually managed to get communications out of China to the West without being locked up and put on trial and so on. Um, those anecdotal citizen reports will turn out to be much closer to the reality than uh, the numbers our government seem stupidly and blindly to be working on or not working on. Anyway, so my concern health-wise would be for my dad, my stepmom, uh, my mum, those are all old people now and none of them would probably have the strong enough immune system or they would struggle to defeat this virus on their own. And of course, if you've been following it, you know you know that even if you take the, the Chinese numbers uh, as credible, which I don't, and let's say the Wuhan area alone had, what is it now, 16, 18,000 serious illness cases, and you take a similar sized area, Greater London, for example, and ask where they're going to get 16,000 intensive care beds from. There aren't even point more, not one of a percent of that, apparently. <coughs> so, now we're now starting to hear so-called realists popping up and saying, actually, if the numbers do go that way, then you're going to see the only thing the government can do is bring in the army. And you're going to see field hospitals or field quarantine set up in tents and uh, you know, probably clustered around major hospitals but you know uh, and of course even then we, we probably don't even have enough armed forces personnel if it's a really serious big outbreak which is hilarious or not hilarious so this is where the feels like where all this culture of cutting and austerity or just cutting of public services actually it just feels like it's going to a perfect storm. You've got the flooding, we've got this virus outbreak, and we've got the beautiful government cuts on all of these public services that you would need in a time of such a crisis, <coughs> um, and the government making it even more difficult to the NHS to recruit people from overseas anymore, uh, and so on and so on. It just feels feels a bit, a bit of a perfect storm in that sense. Anyway, um, <clears throat> if Google thinks this is too sensitive a subject and too depressing and it might be too triggering for advertisers, uh, then do, uh, do demonetize me because that's the way it has to be. Um, oh, something, something. Uh, who did I watch? Oh, Rick Beato. Rick Beato on uh, on YouTube. I don't know if you follow him. He's a great uh, musician. He's I think he's kind of don't know him well in terms of his history, but I think he's a I think he's a a, a very respected session musician and a music uh, and a you know guitar music teacher online. Um, I came across his channel at some point. I just liked his style and kind of subscribed. Anyway, um, I watched a video of his the other day and. <laughs> He was fumingly angry, and I'm getting used to seeing people fuming at um, e eBay, YouTube's censorship. Um, maybe not even cen well, some of it at y YouTube's censorship, uh, social engineering, um, and but also things that uh, I guess YouTube are 
allowing, stroke encouraging. Um, I'll just use some um, thinners there just to get the grime off this very quickly. Um, okay, um, that's nice and dry, baby. Now what I want to do is I just want to go over the body and paintwork with a bit of this um, prior to what I'm going to do. Oh yes, oil up and respring. So let me just slop, slop this about. Obviously, um, if you want to degrease a fingerboard quickly, um, you, you'd use only maps. The, um, the, the cellulose thinners are, are good um, away from finish um, if you know that, you, for example, it's safe on, it's even safe on uh, poly if you had to. Let's say there was some material on there you couldn't get off any other way. You could, you could use it, um, but you would never go near uh, a nitrocellulose finish, for example, or anything you didn't know what the finish was with um, cellulose thinners, you'd, you'd keep away. Um, but if you know what you're dealing with, and it's it's uh, it is only polyurethane finish and or uh, even acrylic I think you can probably use it with you can do it and it's a very a very good mm, not word a uh, grease cutter insolvent is the word I'm looking for okay so we've uh, got all the setup part of it done um, I'm going to pause this in a second because what I want to do is I want to just, while well, I've got this nut here, I want to change tack and make a couple more or one more bass um, for another guitar that's coming up and I haven't got a bass for it. So while I'm at it, let's do that. Um, let's have a feel of these. Yeah, they're not bad. They were quite sharp to begin with. Anyway, so just... Um, Generally speaking, not very confident, I have to say. So, over this weekend, um, oh, I was going to say another thing. Um, unfortunately, or worryingly, um, my wife is going up to Scotland this weekend to visit uh, my stepdaughter, who's had her baby recently, and she can't wait to go and see the new baby. And... Uh, that's great, and I know how much it means to her. But I'm also, understandably, a little bit nervous about the fact that it's going to require going through Edinburgh. Is that cracked? No. Um, yeah, hanging out a bit in Edinburgh Airport um, with crowds of travellers, which I would be more happier with if she wasn't. But that's just how it is, I'm afraid. So this weekend, um, Claire's going to need to be conscious. I suppose everybody else will be too. Um, you might see some weird behaviours. And I expect by the time you get to a, an, an international airport, which um, Edinburgh is, albeit a smallish one, um, I expect you will see the face masks out and about in use by the public or some of the public. So I kind of look forward to hearing from her on that. But uh, I would, if I'm honest, I wish she didn't have to go at this point in time because, in a way, it's uh, it's going to be probably the the big weakness in our say plan because we haven't got a plan but I suppose a strategy our infection risk minimization strategy <laughs> infection control strategy you get what I mean um, so yeah we don't really have much of a say in it okay so uh, one of the things I learned yesterday is that when you make up these nuts you, you can't uh, you can't take the piece out and the, the, I stupidly did on one of them I took out the, uh, the you know the adjustable piece you can't take the piece out and let the thing dry on its own because what happens is you will uh, it'll shrink now the, the one with the piece in it 
also shrinks. Uh, but it then is prevented from shrinking any further by the inclusion of the work piece, as it were, the adjustable tusk nut. So um, this time I'm going to borrow Matitz's uh, <laughs> adjustable nut. God, I can't seem to keep my hands on these things. I'm going to borrow his adjustable nut, his tusk thing, and uh, I'm going to spill this yet again and throw more of it away. Uh, and then I'm going to let it sit in the next half an hour or so offline. So I shall depart for now and I'll do a couple of other things while I'm at it. But I just forgot completely. Look, I, I normally return on topic to what I started talking about. Um, but I completely lost track there. And you, you were probably at that point thinking, what's he on about? Come back and finish the story. The story, of course, was Rick Beato and um, YouTube. Uh, or mm, YouTube? Not exactly YouTube, but anyway, Rick Beato and his YouTube channel. And so this, the, the story is, he, he does teaching, and this is a big issue actually for a lot of guitar teachers. Um, more and more of them are discovering that they aren't able to play or teach records, records, famous records, famous tracks uh, on their YouTube channels. Um, I think even Justin Sandico has a, had an issue with this. I don't know if he still does, but um, anyway. So more and more uh, YouTube teachers are finding themselves being hit with copyright strikes um, for uh, playing a certain combination of notes from a famous song um, or teaching a famous song and singing it or whatever they do to, to teach it. And um, this, of course, is making it impossible to teach, you know, the classics that everybody wants to learn, um, which kind of seems really incredible. Uh, you know, to imagine that you, you can't actually teach the, the classics, you know, um, online anyway. So anyway, um, so Rick Beato was uh, said that he, he recently got forgotten what the song was now, I'm sorry, but he recently got a, a note, or a, it's not a strike, you get a warning, a violation, you, you got a copyright violation um, from a music publisher, and again, I've forgotten exactly which one it was, but it was over the issue of um, him playing a certain song to teach it, or, or, I think it was about five notes or something, it was a really small portion of that song, but anyhow, he got a, a violation, or a, a yeah, a, a notice. And um, it turns out that, and this is, I haven't seen, I've had a, a copyright viol violation for using a piece of Jean-Michel Jarre music in a video I made of snorkeling in the Maldives or something, or anyway. Um, so, so he noticed that when he got this violation, uh, yeah, this warning, it, it stated, um, detected manually, or I called it a manual warning or manual detection or something. And he's done some research and it turns out that it confirms his suspicions and he's since discovered that the music companies now have dedicated staff who sit in the offices at the music publishers in the big cities and go through the popular teacher's channels to identify small, manually, physically, humanly, identify, not with algorithms, but with a human ear. They go to specifically to the teachers uh, who are popular to find infringements, i.e. where they're using a series, playing a series of notes from a copyrighted song to be able to raise a, a claim against that teacher. And what happens is, in the case of Rick's video, in that particular video, um, they, they get warned and then they get told that the solution is either to take down the video, I think that's an option, um, or you share the revenue with the big record company. And the revenue share, I think Rick said, was 70-30 in favour of the uh, record company. So can you imagine, the, I suppose the cynicism of the big record company, not only uh, not only happy with its take of 
royalties anyway. But employing at cost, in fact, you know, uh, calculating the cost of employing a staff member solely to generate revenue from catching out people like Rick or even Justin Sandico. And uh, you can see in this video, I recommend you go and look at it, uh, search for it. Um, just look through his recent videos. But you, you could see the fury uh, in Rick. And I know that from watching his stuff, I know he doesn't normally complain about you know, the, the daily ups and downs of being a content producer. He, he's much more focused on the music to his credit. Um, but he was, you could see, he was absolutely sickened by the cynicism of this. And uh, it's absolutely true. And it's what a what a cynical and destructive approach. Because if you think about it now, um, it now means that online teachers like Rick cannot be any more online teachers. What can you teach if you can't reference the the songs that all guitarists, most musicians who start off want to emulate in some form or other, you know, the things that get them inspired to start in the first place. They want to play them, they want to entertain themselves, maybe be in cover bands, you know, um, one day. And music publishers go, oh no, oh no, no, it's an opportunity for us to make more. And we'll, we don't care what it does to the world of people looking to learn the guitar and enjoy that pastime. We will, we will just shut it down unless we can make money out of it. It's pretty disgusting. Anyway, I just thought I would um, just finish that thought off because uh, it was a bit of a, a non sec in danger of a non sequitur. So what I'm doing here, by the way, is I'm just, it's a custom neck, or custom guitar I'm building, and I'm just having to uh, re-cut the nut slots, because they're almost, no, the fret slots were almost uh, at a point where uh, they were lost in the uh, routing of the radius. The routing of the radius. So I'm just, um, Looking to re remark them, and, and frankly, I don't have any better device for doing it than this. Um, I'm hoping to keep this in line. It's quite hard if you do lose the the slot. It's quite hard to do anything. <laughs> and this saw is quite good, but not that good. I think I drew, I think what's made it harder there is I drew a pencil line on there which was slightly off the mark. So I've got to trust the uh, saw line more than the pencil line. So it's slow, but slow but sure. This is a fairly medium uh, gauge fret wire so it doesn't need to be any wider than this this will do but anyway I'm sort of just killing two birds with one stones here anyway that was just to finish that thought see you in a minute so I thought I'd uh, just come in get prepared for you know the next couple of months actually not very not very effective now I've gone and made my glasses all messy um, right is evening of Friday and it's rainy but I've got I decided because <clears throat> I want this to be perfect I'm going to I have made another nut and I'm replacing <coughs> uh, the one on this guitar so Matitz can have a new adjustable nut I think just a little bit completed fuller looking round the side so this little fella sits here nice and low actually it might even be a millifraction too low but that's no problem at all we'll sort that out now what i've got stay in the meantime let's put some uh of this nice stuff oil on this fingerboard although 
forgotten the make of the material. Sometimes they used to call it Rose Acer, but I think Harley Benton either used something else or, or gave something a different name. So it's something else now. So basically, this is the poor point of the setup that we can just, inverted commas, put it back together. Everything is in order and it should just revert to the setup that we had before. The only possible difference being if the, uh, if the gauge of strings is higher. Uh, they only ball tens if they happen to be a bit whoops, heavier than um, what was on there from um, the, the Toman. But I, I'm not sure they will be. I think they'll be pretty much the same. Uh, okay, so nice tidy. So we have got, ah, uh, now, one thing I just ought to do really, now, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to trust my instinct. I've wound this up a bit. Um, why did I wind it up? Because I thought I needed to. So I'm going to wind these out and let this thing fit back down into its little base. And we're going to work from there. Um, now, the problem I've got is I do really need to stick this in. And I have to stick it in only if I trust that I've got the right deal going on here and I think I do he said <clears throat> with great confidence so I'm gonna, gonna put a little touch on here and here but not so much and then I'm going to get it on there and I'm going to line it up by hand and then I'm going to just push it in on the base just to make sure it's seating where I want it to seat. Okay. So now we get our new sorry, our new strings. And put them on. Our bridge uh, was that the, oh yes I need to change the intonation on the bridge. Remember and we were going from the front from the high E we'd got right. So here comes the other ones I'm going to make them line up, i.e. a bit stiff, but it's a good bridge, but it's just a little bit stiff on the screws. There we go. Actually, it's pretty close if that's... Uh, yes, I did the high e, that's correct. Du -du 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 -du. All correct, present and correct. Uh, it'll have lowered down, so we have to just be ready to give it a tiny upwards tweak on whichever side is necessary. And then the stop bar, which I've also put lower down than it was. Okay. <clears throat> Our young Morris is in here, having a little rest or re respite from the stinking rain out there. And then we'll just. Oh, I shouldn't put this one first, should I? I should put. The middle one on, that would be a good idea. Set the right example, Sam. Yes, I will. Okay, so you can see that this guitar has taken me longer than it normally would. And that's mainly because um, of getting the nut right and also getting the, uh, getting the bridge right as well, which wasn't completely straightforward. Um, and it's... In a way, it's in response to a slight problem with the Harley Benton uh, original bridge, really. Um, with, the, with the clicking saddle, it might have been able to fix it, but do you know what? When you start messing around with a, a tiny little saddle, there's not a lot you can do with them. And if it's clicking from side to side when you bend the string, then honestly, I don't really know what there is you can do about it. Um, so it's simpler to change the bridge, but then as I mentioned, these Harley Bentons seem to have the quite intolerant, or there's not a lot of leeway for lowering the bridge. And uh, I've, I've spoken to a couple of people just recently who suffered or were struggling with exactly that problem. Now, in, in restringing um, at it, so you might want to see my take note of my guide. I go pull it all the way through. Um, down oh, oh, that shouldn't have gone there. 
weird. It's going to go down, whatever. Right, um, I pull it all the way through and then pull back uh, one fret's worth, hold it down and then wind it on. And then I let the held string go over the loose string. So the loose string goes underneath and then I hold the, the string and guide it downwards the second time round so that the loose string here goes over the top and the held string is directed underneath and that locks the string off quite nicely in a little locking sort of thing. Um, once, you know, some people get really obsessed with putting knots in strings and things and uh, they think or they hope that it helps with the tuning and uh, as I've said in many a video, the only thing that sorts your tuning out is getting your nut slots right and getting your slack out of your strings. Um, your, your tuners counterintuitively have almost nothing to do with it. Um, better tuners certainly make the process of tuning um, smoother and feel easier, um, but they actually don't. They don't really affect the tuning. Um, and so if you if you get the nut slot right, or in the case of this now with this uh, adjustable nut, that's the nut slots taken care of. And now when we once we stretch the strings out in a minute, um, this guitar will stay and play in tune, It'll play in tune and stay in tune very well from here onwards. And it's because of those two things. And from here on, um, Matitz only has to really stretch any new sets of new strings that he puts on and make sure they are fully stretched out. And that is actually a lot more stretched out than most people can be bothered to do. So it's very important to see that it, it'll take about 15 minutes of concentrated effort. And it could be 20 minutes, could be 25 if you do it properly. Um, a, ca a quick sort of yank on strings isn't enough. It's not going to do the job. And if you don't get the slack out, what happens is, is you'll pay for it in, for months and months and months. And I keep getting guitars through where I, no matter how, how long the owners had them and played with those strings, I can just yank the strings and they go massively out of tune. And it isn't because the tuners are rolling backwards or any silly thing like that. It is all to do with the slack still in the strings even after all that time. So there's only one way to get it out and that is to physically pull it out. And some people, I've had comments in the past where people think I'm just being completely ridiculous about this. And I think that if it comes down to meaning that your guitar stays in tune from the offset, from when you pick it up to when you put it down and pick it up again, that, that is such a big payoff that um, I think, uh, where am I going, underneath, yeah. I think um, it's absolutely worth putting the effort into. You know, and if you're a gigging musician, you know, you won't have to be checking your tuning between songs and so on and so on. So it really makes sense. It's a much better experience to have a guitar that's in tune when you pick it up. Now I'm not going anywhere, Mark. I'm staying in here. So the first thing I do when I put the new strings on is I'll cut them back to a safe length so I don't get or you don't get uh, wasp stings. I hate getting stung by the strings. It really drives me mad. Um, so that's my first priority. And then once I've done that, and we've got to stretch the strings and just make sure that they are bedded where they need to be. And I can look at the nut and make sure that's in its right place too. The new base on the nut, same nut, just a new base. Um, I'll reuse the other one for one of my guitars where I'm not too bothered about the look so much. Um, so I'm just gently tugging on these to get them sort of seated in place. And this will sort of take out a fair bit of the slag. Now I can hear it banging on the first fret at the moment. The strings are hitting the first fret. So that's cool. We are going to adjust that in a minute. Morris is going to come up and check. So just putting them under a bit of tension. Hello boy. So the first thing I'm going to do is get the little hex key and we're going to use that to raise up the strings with the adjustable nut. Here we go. All right. 
Now we're going to get a note from the tuner. What you'll hear with this, um, I don't know how this works, this is a crap old thing. What you'll hear with this, um, this tusk nut is now you'll hear no pings at all. When you put this under tension, what you'll find is it will, the nut may bed down. Oh boy, you are so sweet. You are my boy. I kind of need you to be chilling out down there, really. So, we've we're quite low now still on the Morris. You're making this hard. I've lost the hex key. That's not your fault. So we'll just put this, raise this up a little bit. I can see it now, that's good. And a tiny bit more on the base side. And there we are. Now, um, what I'm going to do is just give it a little more pull here. And then we'll go into different stretches in a minute. So satisfying about tuning with this um, tusk insert is that you can hear that it's very linear um, the tuning just goes no no jumps no dead spots it just tunes right to where you want it okay so we are should be pretty much on the minimum down here Actually, it's a bit a bit low so we come up a little bit on the base it up, he said. Um, okay, 1.5 fraction over, so clockwise, and then we check on the treble side, and that's exactly on the 1.2. Right, Mr. Boy, you're sort of come over here. You're going to need to go down. Ooh. Need to go down so I can get this done. All right, per. I've been watching this great Japanese channel recently. A guy in one of the cat islands, I think it's just one of the little islands where they fish. I think I might have said this before, but um, anyway, I've been watching it and he doesn't say anything, this guy. You never see him, you see his leg or his arm, hand, but he uh, he walks around with a, with a camera on a stick and he goes and follows cats around. And they're very different cats in, Japan than they are here. They're, they're sort of wild but they're looked after by the uh, fishermen because the fishermen first of all believe it brings them luck I, I think and also um, they, uh, the cats help obviously to catch rats so they feed them fish to keep them um, healthy and well and to keep good luck and so the cats are very good natured and they're also um, yeah, they're good natured and they're, um, how would you describe it? Good natured and they look like they're not strays, but they do live wild by all accounts. Anyway, um, so the channel, the guy, I can't tell you what the channel is called, but you'd have to search, but uh, the guy just sort of walks around and um, comes across these cats and uh, talks to them or, or hangs out with them and follows them with his camera. So you don't ever really see anything other than the kind of life from the cat's point of view, which is funny to watch. Um, and also the thing I like is that behind these lovely cats, uh, whatever they're doing, you get to see this sort of cat eye view of uh, fishing village, rural Japan, which you don't necessarily normally get to see um, other than, well, not very often anyway. Sometimes you get to see it in those 
I don't know, tsunami videos or whatever, if you watch that sort of thing. But So it's, uh, it's quite an interesting and different world. Now what I'm going to do, by the way, I'm just going to, I'm going to basically get this thing. It's called the switch, and I'm going to turn it back to where it should be. It's slightly off centre. Is it alright? No, just a little bit. I'm just going to turn it back. Yeah, that's loose, you see. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to get this device to thingy it, uh, to tighten it. If I get the right side of it, I never know which is the right side. And I'm going to use the other thing I've got in my other hand to hold it so it doesn't move. Because um, that's one of the downsides of doing this is that it's often you'll get the whole switch spinning. So that's that tightened up and the switch is still in the right place. Then we'll put the cover back on. I'm going to go back to stretching in a minute, but I just thought I'd do that while I remembered. And I'm also going to tighten up the jack socket and I'm going to tighten up the uh, strap buttons. Just little details before I go any further. Now tonight I've also got uh, Gary's um, Yamaha Pacifica to set up. I mean, I could finish it tomorrow, but I'm going to make a start on it tonight. Um, and then over the weekend, I've got other things to do. Kind of a lot of my own stuff, builds to finish and whatnot. Okay, so let's get the first one tightened up if we can. Just pressing down on it, get it to bite, get it to stay still. Same with this end, this is very loose. Tighten it up, press it down. Yep, that's good. Those are the main wiggly woggly things. Um, now we go back to the tuning. So having stretched it once or twice, now we're now going to take a note, tune it again. out of it. Now I'm always a little more careful with obviously the thin springs because it is easier at this point if you do a lot of stretching you can break the high E string if you're not careful. Um, still not a good enough reason not to do it but it gets costly for me if I do it so I try to just be a little bit more thoughtful as I do the high E. I want not to have to waste a whole pack of strings. See that amount of detuning is the slack. some big bends in because these were what would also normally put your guitar well out of tune so as much as your poor soft little hands can take which isn't a hell of a lot in my case Almost there. Check the amount of relief. It's actually a fraction flatter than before, so I'm going to. Uh, maybe, the, maybe the lighter gauge 
than the ones, but they're definitely ten. So I'm going to uh, take a little bit of the uh, truss rod adjustment off and see if I can just get. This is a positive one. Seems to go positively in both directions, so it's not like it goes slack. I don't think. Um, Okay, a bit of relief there, which is good. Lovely. Well, uh, let's double check. Done, done, height, action done. Um, pickups, good. Actually nice and low now, close but fine. Um, switch tightened, strap buttons tightened. Uh, bridge at the right height, new nut fitted, truss rod adjusted very slightly, just double check it and then we'll put the cover on. A little bit of neck relief, which is better than none. Um, the purpose of the neck relief, obviously, he said, is to allow, um, to allow the strings to move where they have to move, which is closer to the centre of their length, which isn't Funnily enough, it is not exactly the centre of the neck plate or the centre of the fingerboard, so they're misaligned really. But either which way, the, uh, the strings do need a bit more room to move nearer their centre, and so that's what the truss rod or the relief curve on the neck is to give you really. Um, so you have to have a little, you don't have to, you can play the guitar often without, but the rule of thumb is that the, the less, the flatter the neck is the better the frets you're going to need to have, the more level the frets, and or the higher the action, um, unless it's a very, very precise fingerboard, in which case, you know, sometimes like on a, a good Ibanez or something, quality made Ibanez, you can get a very flat neck, very low action, and everything works great. Um, but by and large, it's the interrelation between those things, uh, you have to balance off against each other. And typically, if you want a flat neck, you have to con concede or compromise with the, uh, the playing action a little bit. Um, there you go. So there's our done Harley Benton ready to go back to Slovenia. So Matt, it's, I hope you enjoyed that. It was a bit long-winded at times, but everything's good and it's ready to, uh, ready to head home, hopefully first thing in the week. Thanks for watching. See you again soon.